Make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe below for more ghoulish tales. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dark Forest. Tonight, I put together 24 Dogman tales for you. I composed the last five videos into one for one frightful good night. Or maybe it's your last. I live in western Canada. Kinda near Vancouver, but a little more woodsy, to say the least. Never been much of a city folk myself, but I work in the city, but where I live, it's more country-like. Kinda like a small town, but I like it that way. I've been here all my life. I've taken vacations to the United States and other parts of Alaska, but Canada is home. Yes. We have some very harsh winters, beautiful summers, amazing springs, and fall, well, falls just like anywhere else. This happened a year ago in springtime of 2019, but it feels like yesterday, and it still haunts my dreams. It was the beginning of spring break. I currently attend the University of British Columbia. Might I add, this is 100% true. I don't care what anyone says. I remember it was a Saturday morning. My classmate and best friend Luke and I wanted to go on a great hike. We did some research and found out this great area north of town. It was called Lower Seymour Conservation Reserve. It was breathtaking to say the least online when we looked it up, and we knew that we had to spend the day there hiking. After arriving and parking our car on Lillooet Road, we hopped on the Seymour Valley Trail heading north. We had our backpacks full of snacks and trail mixes and waters, of course. We were really having a great time just talking and laughing about school stuff and girls and whatever else we were talking about at the time. I remember it was a bright and sunny day that morning, yet as soon as we arrived to this area, it got gloomy fast. Even though it was only the afternoon, it felt like it was already in the evening how dark the clouds were above us. Were those rain clouds? They sure were dark. Luckily, I had a light sweater on. So did Luke. But nothing heavy if it was to rain. If it started the rain, we would have to hightail it back to the parking lot. Man... This place was so gorgeous. It was so green. And the hiking trails weren't that steep. Uh, yes, I'm a little overweight, so I don't want anything too hardcore, if you know what I mean. This place was gorgeous. Breathtaking. I don't know where the time went. I don't believe we were hiking that long, but it was already getting dark. I know we were kind of messing around hiking and taking plenty of breaks along the way, just shooting the shit and having snacks, but it was utterly like sunset already. It was already getting dark. I guess that's what happens when you're having fun, right? You lose track of time. I mean, that's what we assumed it to be. We noticed to our left, there was a turnoff. Hmm. Do we continue to go straight or go off track and head left? We decided to take that left, just to see where it would take us. Eventually going down that trail, we noticed that there was this huge lake. There was a wooden sign that said, Rice Lake in front of us. Sweet, I said. Luke made a joke. Hmm, I wonder if they'll have some chow mein over there too. Ha ha ha, very funny. That's probably not even the reason why they call it Rice Lake, I replied. They may have not had chow mein, but we may have been chow mein for something else. When we started to approach the lake, we noticed that there was something hunched over near the edge of the waterline. Something big. Something... Something unworldly. We both stopped in our tracks. 
dude, what the hell is that? Luke looked puzzled. I, I think it's a wolf or something, he replied. Whatever it was, it was devouring something. We couldn't tell. As I said before, it was starting to get dark, and this thing was black as midnight itself, which didn't help at all for our vision to see what the hell was going on. As our eyes started to adjust to the darkness, we noticed that this was no normal wolf, nor coyote. No, it was too small to be a coyote. Plus, that's more of an American thing. We're in Canada. We get the real beasts. All of a sudden, the beast stops devouring whatever the hell it was eating, and we could hear it breathing heavily. Its breathing had bass in it, like some subwoofers in the back seat of a Honda hatchback. We just stood there stunned. Then, this thing uses its front paws. No, let me rephrase that. Claws. And it rips whatever it was eating and tosses some pieces behind it like some unwanted section it didn't like. Since when did wolves become picky eaters? The moon was bright, so incredibly bright that night. We could see the reflection of the full moon against the top of the waterbed. The beast slowly turns its head sideways towards our direction. We could see the illumination from the moonlight gleaming in his eyes. Or was his eyes glowing? God, God help us either way. Did it see us? I mean, we were just standing there on the trail. We weren't close by, but still. We were in plain sight if this thing was nocturnal in any ways. I leaned over to my buddy Luke and whispered to him, We need to get the hell out of here, quietly. He nodded his head without saying a word. We slowly started the backtrack on the trail. Backwards, of course. There was no way I was taking my eyes off of this thing until I felt more comfortable. What the hell was it? As we were slowly walking backwards back to the tee on the trail, this thing hopped on its back hind legs lifted its head up to the sky and let out a horrific howl. A howl that I've never heard before. This beast was at least seven feet tall, strawny, but pure muscle. It had black fur. In its eyes, I swear to you, its eyes were still glowing. As soon as we made a right-hand turn at that tee, we both hightailed it back to the parking lot where our truck was. I am so grateful that that thing didn't chase us. I don't know if it was warning us with the howl, or if it just truly didn't know that our presence was there. Either which way, we never went back there to hike again. My wife and I flew out to Orlando, Florida for her master's degree in psychology's graduation. It was a beautiful ceremony. She met up with a couple of her classmates that she had been friends with online for her university. We drove around sightseeing, ate at plenty of different seafood Cajun restaurants. I mean, they had great restaurants everywhere, especially El Pollo Tropical, which is like a drive through place. It was fantastic. I'm obsessed with the black beans and rice. Fast forward a couple days. I have family down in Okeechobee, Florida, which is a small little fisherman's town at the north tip of the lake. It was about a 2 hour and 15 minute drive, and we decided to avoid the tolls as we didn't pay for it with our rental, and we took the back roads down there. The drive was beautiful. It was green in every direction that you would look. Now it's springtime, so everything was just out and about. Except for the gators. We never did see any gators. 
I guess they don't like the cold weather. Yes, Florida does have chilly weather. Just wait until summertime, then you're screwed. We were told that there was a crazy cold front that usually happens around this time of year, so it kind of throws everything off with the wildlife. If you live in Florida, or have ever visited before, you know how wet and flat the state is. The swamps. The swamps are everywhere. You have to watch your step if you're outside, or else you might lose your foot. I swear, I avoid any contact with any type of water as much as possible out there. You just never know what creepy crawlies or giant alligators are around. Especially for tourists. And especially hearing about that thing about the kid that got snatched up by an alligator at Disney World. Yeah, it's best to just keep on your guard if you're just touristing. So we were visiting some family. And in their backyard, there's a canal that leads to Lake Okeechobee from their backyard where they have a little boathouse, if you say. It's kind of like a little mini dock in your backyard where you could fit a small boat. It's pretty awesome, actually. So, a few beers later and a couple shots of vodka, my stepdad and I were fishing off of the back dock. Just shooting the shit and talking and catching up on old times and memories and stuff like that. My wife was behind us, sitting in the chair, taking pictures of this huge giant pelican-like bird that was just hanging out near us. It was trippy because my stepdad, I guess, feeds it when he's fishing because uh, the birds just had no fear of him at all. And he named him Harry. He just stood there waiting to be fed. The turtles kept trying to take our bait. It was starting to annoy us. It was quiet at the swamps that night, which is pretty unusual. It was cold that night, which is very unusual. The day before, the humidity was just scorching. My stepdad went inside because he had to take a leak. I stood there with my fishing pole just chilling, sipping on my Corona beer. All of a sudden, this huge pelican-like bird, Harry, just flips out and flies away from us, screaming at the top of its bird lungs. Something startled the hell out of it, and at the exact same time, his dog Bella, which is this huge, fat, silverish Weimariner dog, is barking at the top of her lungs at the fence in the backyard just behind us. I stood up from my lawn chair and looked around. What is it, girl? What's going on? What do you see? Now at this point, it's pretty pitch black out. He has this small little searchlight like light that's hanging off the edge of the back wooden dock where we were fishing. I don't know why, but I suddenly had the creeps. Almost like I felt like I was being watched. I turned around to my wife, and she just stood there in confusion like, What's wrong? I don't hear anything. Why did that bird just freak out like that, and why is Bella barking at nothing? I responded. She shrugged, and just said that she was going to go inside. Oh, great. She's so going to leave me out here to fish and clean up on myself? Thanks, hon, I said to her as she walked up the hill. Well, now I know why man invented beer, I shrugged as I took a swig of my Corona. But still, something was bothering me. I grabbed a little mini flashlight, spotlight thing, whatever you want to call it, and I was shining it on the water. It was smooth. There was no motion on the water whatsoever. I motioned the searchlight to my left, and I saw nothing. Just neighbors with their boats and their little docks. Nothing spectacular, nothing out of the ordinary. I shined it across the water in front of me at the neighbor across the way. Same thing. Nothing. It's when I shined it to my right at the edge of the canal. The area where it stops where the road crosses to the next neighboring street across the way. At the end of the canal... There was this huge French-like drain circular metal thing that connected the water to go underneath the ground. It must have led to somewhere across the street on the other side. It was almost like a man-made cave made out of steel. And of course, the road was above it. 
so the water from the canal just went right in. I guess that was to prevent any floods, so the water for the current from any rain or storm would have somewhere to take it to, preventing it from piling up and getting too high to flood people's backyards. When I shined my light in that direction, though, the lake water wasn't the only thing that was inside that large metal tubing in the road. There was something crawling out from it, heading up the hill towards my direction. I almost dropped the light in fright. This thing was crawling on all fours. It had shaggy black fur. Its face looked like a dog, a very large dog, but its body shape was more like a man. It didn't have a tail from what I remembered. At this point, I was already running back to the back porch anyways. I screamed for my stepdad and my wife. They ran to the door as I was running up there babbling trying to explain to him what I had seen. My dad urged me to come inside and he locked the door and sat me down. He handed me a cloth as I wiped the sweat off of my forehead and face. I was mumbling like a baby, shaken and a loss for words. I took a shot of vodka and a swig of another beer since I left mine outside and I started to relax my breathing and calm down. I explained everything to him. I told him every little detail that I could remember when I shined the light in that direction by that... at that thing, whatever it was. My stepdad just sat down next to me. He put his hand on my shoulder and he just laid it out on me. He told me that this isn't the first time that anyone has reported instances like this in his town. Now there's only about 5,000 plus people in this actual small town, but the county of Okeechobee has a lot more. There have been several sightings and animals have been reported missing within the past couple of months. He said that the local legends talk about a furry man dog beast, better known as a dog man is bounded somehow to this area. He told me that he did some research on it as he's seen it himself. Down at the public library, sightings of this dogman creature have dated back to the 1940s. Even a child went missing once. He said usually the reports are coming from local hunters, but like I said, he's seen it for himself. Grab your guns and grab your knives, because the dog man hunts at night. So I've been dating this girl now for about two months. We have gone out quite a few times, be it for coffee, dinner, or a movie. This morning she texted me and asked me if I wanted to spend our month anniversary out camping. Her name was Brittany, and she was extremely into the outdoor lifestyle. How could I say no at this point? This would be the first time since I've met her that we'd be sleeping together in the same vicinity. Well that, and she also kind of thinks I'm a huge fan of camping. But that, that's my fault, because we met in an outdoorsy type store. When I bumped into Brittany, I was bewildered by her beautiful face. She had a radiant personality that just drew me right in. Now I know what you're thinking, if you're not into the wilderness lifestyle, why were you at the outdoor store? I was there in search of a BB gun. There's a group of trash pandas that come by my house nightly and try to raid my garbage can. I was attempting to take the humane way out, I didn't want to kill them, I just wanted to make sure they knew they weren't welcome. So that brings us back to our main predicament here. I hate camping, but I really like my girlfriend, and I would really like to get laid. So with a plastered on smile, I agreed to rough it outdoors. We decided to make a long weekend out of our getaway. With our bags filled to the brim with survival equipment, we grabbed the rest of the stuff we needed at Brittany's garage and placed it in her Jeep. We left early Friday morning and drove all the way up to the Appalachia. We arrived in the early afternoon. From where we parked the Jeep, it was a 45 minute trek up to the camping site. Our destination was Wolf's Peak. I was a little creeped out as we hiked up the trail and every now and again you would see slash marks in the trees. They seemed extremely unnatural. 
As bothering as they were, I couldn't let Brittany know that I was rattled by this, or else I could ruin my chances of getting lucky tonight. We reached our destination by high noon. We started unpacking and setting up camp, and it was my job to put the tent together. As I wrestled with it, since I'm not very great with this kind of stuff, Brittany headed off to get us water from a stream nearby. As I wrestled with the damn thing, all of a sudden the hair stood up on the back of my neck, and I got a cold feeling in my gut. It felt... It felt like I was being watched. I stopped and scanned the surrounding area for any kind of movement or life. I saw nothing. That uneasy feeling I had gotten while pitching the tent never truly went away. Even after I had finished, I just couldn't shake the feeling that there was something that didn't want us here. After wrestling with this damn thing for 30 minutes, I finally got it to stand. I began to lay out the sleeping bags inside the tent. As I went to exit, I noticed a shadow standing outside. I rushed out to see what it was. There was nobody. I started to circle the tent just to make sure I wasn't imagining things, when suddenly I felt a strong force from behind me. Two hands forced me to the ground with a rough shove. I quickly spun around after hitting the ground to see who had shoved me. I abruptly let out a scream. <coughs> a tall man in a hockey mask leered over me, holding a machete in his right hand. He raised the hand with the machete above his head. I closed my eyes and put my hand over my face in fear, and I waited for it to swing down on me and end my life. After a few seconds went by, I could hear laughter female laughter. What the hell? The imposter Jason laughed as it dropped its machete and ripped not one but two masks off. Underneath was the ever-growing grin of my girlfriend. After a bit of poking and teasing, she reminded me we were up in the mountains, not down by a lakeside. Brittany claimed the scariest thing up here was maybe a pack of wolves, hence the name of the campsite, Wolf's Peak. After Brittany's little scare tactic, we decided we'd go looking for fallen branches so we could have a nice fire for tonight. As we combed the brush for acceptable pieces of wood, we came upon the mouth of a cave. It had a few signs hung in the entrance that were quite alarming. Stay out or else. Enter and you will die. Brittany's eyes lit up. I gave her a stern long face and said, No. Brittany smirked and rolled her eyes and said, You're just a big fat chicken then. After which she dropped her wood, put her arms to her sides, and started making fun of me like she was a chicken, clucking and all. After about 20 seconds of her tirade, I dropped my wood too, but not because she was annoying me. No, this is because I had locked eyes with something in the cave. I was transfixed in the gaze of two yellow floating orbs in the back of the cave. Brittany soon stopped after she caught a glimpse of what I was staring at. After hearing a light growl, we both slowly backed away from the cave entrance, leaving the wood we had gathered. We locked hands and calmly and quickly left the area. As we sped walked away, I shot a slight jab at her. Wolf's peak, huh? She slowly shook her head as we kept walking. On our way back to the campsite, we slowly picked up firewood as we kept an eye behind us, making sure whatever we saw hadn't followed us back. Soon enough, it was nightfall. We had a good old-fashioned fire cooking. We roasted hot dogs. What we had seen earlier, though, kind of really killed the mood of this whole trip. Then I got an idea. Maybe we should fight fire with fire. Or in this case, fear with fear. Maybe some good old-fashioned ghost stories around the fire would take our minds off of things. I started first. I told her the tale of a headless ghost who was doomed to roam a house bound by the sea. Brittany soon got into the spirit of things and took her turn telling me a tale about an evil pop-up amusement park. My next tale was about an evil doll who came to life after a certain set of words were read to it in a certain order. And when it came back to Brittany, she told me the tale of the dog man. The story hit a little too close to home when she ended it by saying it was a local legend. Immediately I thought back to the entrance of the cave. Afterwards, we put out our fire and decided it was time for bed. The events after that transpired were exactly what I had hoped they would be. Maybe camping didn't suck so bad after all. After our extraneous activities, both of us fell asleep pretty quickly. I kept having the same nightmare where I was back in front of the entrance of that cave. After something charged out of the cave mouth at me, I woke up in a cold sweat. I looked over and Brittany was gone. I exited the tent. After a quick sweep around the campsite, I realized I was completely alone. I rushed back to the tent and grabbed my cell phone. I dialed Brittany's number frantically. I heard it. It was ringing, and it didn't sound far from me. I slowly followed the sound. It was laying behind a tree about 20 feet away from our tent. As I leaned down to pick it up, I heard a voice from behind me. A stern, Hey! As I turned around, I was met with something coming at my face extremely fast. I felt a sharp pain as something whacked me in the face, and I started to black out as I slumped over. As I drifted out of consciousness, I felt somebody wrap their arms around my legs and start dragging me. When I awoke later, there was a cool sensation against my back. It felt like stone. I went to rub my face where I was hit, and my movement was restricted by a loud clanging chain. And immediately after I rattled that metal to my bondage, I heard a loud roar. I tensed up and started to squint, trying to adjust my eyes to the darkness that surrounded me. 
I was able to make out two dark figures. There was one more dire detail I could make out even in my haze. There were two glowing amber orbs across the room. With a few shaky breaths I let out of the who's there. The sound of footsteps approached me, along with a shrill cackle. That laugh. I know that laugh. Brittany. I gathered up some courage and raised my voice. Just what the hell do you think you're doing, Brittany? After approaching me, she got face to face with me as she kneeled down. She growled in a sinister voice. I'm taking care of my boyfriend. I snapped back angrily. This is a fine way to take care of somebody. She coldly replied, I never said you. She then got up and walked away from me. She then mentioned that the story she had told by the fire, the last one, about the dog bin, wasn't necessarily not true. I replied with a shocked, what? Brittany replied with a sharp tone. Listen closely. I'm only going to say this once. A few years ago, me and my boyfriend were camping in these very woods. He was attacked by a wolf-like creature. He got a few good shots in on it. As the creature ran away, it fell down and died. Once the creature had slipped away from this world, all its fur had fallen off to reveal a man. A few hours after he was attacked, my boyfriend started to transform. And as for the beast that's chained up across from you, that's what he became. Brittany vanished into the darkness, near where the eyes were glowing. Moments later, I heard a metallic clank. The amber orbs moved towards me as the sound of movement started to pick up in the cave. Suddenly, they vanished and reappeared right in front of my face seconds later, followed by a loud roar right in my face. I felt the dog man sink his fangs into my jugular, and my body began to start to feel cold after a while as he gnawed on my flesh. If I could tell anybody one last thing, it would be fear the dog man. I come from a small town in Florida. We're not known for much. Well, except maybe our swamp. Over the years, the locals have nicknamed this place Pantano de Hambre Lobo, which more or less translates to Swamp of the Werewolf. So yeah, essentially, I come from a town that's famous for its swamp, which is rumored to be home to werewolves. Now, growing up, I never believed this. That was until me and my friends went and ventured into the swamp around the age of 15. It was many years ago when my two best friends and I decided to take an adventure into Pantano de Hambre Lobo. What started out as a dare would be the night that changed our lives forever. One night, my two best friends and I, that go by the name of Chris and Miguel, we were all hanging out in Chris's garage. It was around 9pm on a Saturday night. We were stupid teens who were bored looking for something to do. After we spent about a half an hour roasting each other, Miguel got the great idea we should go do something crazy. To add some context to this, it was summer vacation, so we started brainstorming. What could we do that was crazy? I suggested ding dong ditching. Miguel suggested we go smash some mailboxes. But Chris... Chris had a much more crazy idea than either of those combined. Let's go into the swamp, he said. Both me and Miguel looked at him with a serious manner. The devilish grins we had about doing something diabolical just a moment ago had faded away. But Chris, y you know what's supposed to be out there, I said, panicked. Miguel agreed with me. He said his folks didn't set many rules, but going into the swamp was definitely one of them. Chris rolled his eyes and said, you're both just chicken. Chris squinted and scoffed at us. Do you both really think there's werewolves living in the swamp? It's not an ideal terrain for a wolf. I quickly protested. Okay, so what about all the howling we used to hear back when we were kids? Chris fired back with, Local teens, much like ourselves, keeping the legend alive, having a good time, fucking with kids. Miguel and I were still very hesitant to go into the swamp with Chris. Chris gave us a few seconds to think about it, then stood up and shrugged and said, Well, I'm going either way without you pussies. Chris armed himself with a baseball bat, slumped it over his shoulder, and proceeded down the driveway. Me and Miguel, both more worried about Chris than our own safety at this point, decided to follow him. I felt like Chris was out to prove something. Regardless, friends stick together, so me and Miguel followed behind. There were a few off-beaten paths known to lead to Pantano de Hombre Lobo, but no one in town dared venture into those paths because they were afraid of what they might come across. In the span of a half an hour, we had walked all the way from Chris's garage to the first known path of the swamp. You could have chalked it up to residual nerves, or the fact that the swamp just let off a very unforeboding feeling. Regardless, I knew I was spooked. Chris held his bat out and started swinging it to knock down vines as we entered the small pathway. The air was lousy with the music of nature. Frogs croaking, fish splashing, you could hear crickets chirping, and the sound of the swamp goop bubbling. My number one fears were what my parents had told me as a child. There was a family that was forced into the swamp by the townsfolk. The Gonzalez family never owned a dog, yet multiple reports of howling could be heard on every single full moon coming from their house. Eventually, people started reporting seeing wolf-like figures in their backyards. The problem only got worse as people's livestock and pets started to be slaughtered. Family was accused of being werewolves, 
And one night, the townsfolk rose up during a full moon. They burned down their house and chased the family into the swamp. And since then, if you listen closely in the night of a full moon, you can hear the howling of a wolf coming from the swamp. And due to the legends, no one in town dares set a foot in Pantano de Hombre Lobo. Yet here, us three stupid kids were barging right in. We spent 45 cautious minutes dredging through the swamp, walking over the muddy paths. I couldn't tell you if I was more scared of running into a gator or the actual werewolves. Regardless, Chris was getting bored of this. He swung his bat against a tree. Angrily, Chris proclaimed, This legend's bull. Somebody probably came in here and drowned when they were drunk, and that's why they marked this place as unsafe. And that's probably why they came up with this stupid legend as well. Mockingly, Chris cupped his hands against his mouth and made a wolf sound. Oh! Immediately after, we heard the response of another howl. Immediately, all three of our eyes widened and shocked, and we mouthed to each other, What the fuck? Moments later, all the natural sounds died. The frogs stopped croaking. The crickets stopped singing. The feeling of dread rose as the wind picked up. Miguel grabbed my shoulder and said, We need to get the fuck out of here. As quietly as we could, we started heading back the way we came. The only issue is we were about an hour into this trek. As we picked up the pace, it was about 15 minutes after we had left the spot where Chris had done the initial howl, we heard movement in front of us. Something was creeping around in the brush in front of us. We froze in the line we were walking. Chris cupped his hands and made another wolfly howl. Oh! I glared at him and said, dude, what the hell? He poked me with the bat and said, dude, shut up, relax. I'm trying to track it. Surely enough, like clockwork, we heard another howl echo in the distance. Nervously, I blurted out loud, that sounds a lot closer than the last one had. But it didn't come from in front of us, and that's where the main relief came from. We kept pressing forward. The bushes shook in front of us once more as an angry goose popped out. This was enough to send Miguel over the edge as he freaked out. He bolted ahead of us, screaming in fear. Chris panicked and did another howl, hoping to track the wolf once more. I looked at Chris with panicked white eyes and said, Dude, this is really fucking bad. We picked up the pace and started running full speed trying to catch up to Miguel. Moments later, we heard a scream. Ah! And after jumping through a bush, we leapt over a small stretch of water. We found Miguel sitting on his ass, cowering, with this gigantic creature standing in front of him. Its eyes glowed crimson red under the light of the full moon. Miguel and this thing were locked in a staring match as Miguel held his arm. I could see blood. It took the thing a few seconds to notice me and Chris. And when it finally broke the trance between the staring contest it and Miguel were having, it let out a powerful roar. <laughs> Holy fuck, Chris screamed as he held up the baseball bat in a defensive manner. The werewolf slung down its powerful claws and slashed right through the bat. In a split-second response, Chris alternated attacks to a crotch kick. The creature went down, and I grabbed Miguel and pulled him up over my shoulder. We started hauling ass through the swamp. I never stopped running once. It had to be the adrenaline kicking in. Just as we came upon the exit of the swamp, we heard another deafening roar. The werewolf had leaped out and sideswiped Chris. I glanced back while running and I could see the creature had fully pinned down Chris. He shouted in pain, Keep going! Miguel and I reached the exit and I set him down on the street. I started to head back towards the swamp and Miguel stopped me and said, What do you think you're even going to do? I shook my head as I looked down and said, I don't know. And I jogged back into the swamp. As I re-entered the swamp, I could see multiple figures crowded around the area Chris had gone down. I was smart enough to know that those weren't human. I backed away slowly and made my exit from Pantano de Hombre Lobo. I helped Miguel back up and we hobbled to my house where we had contacted his parents. After we got him medical assistance, we contacted Chris's family. The police were called, but all refused to search the swamp. They declared Chris a missing person's case. Since then, his family's moved away. To this day, I still refuse to go near the swamp. Although, I've noticed if you listen closely on the night of a full moon, you can hear faint howling coming from Pantano de Hombre Lobo. I live in western Alaska. For privacy reasons, I'm not going to get too detailed on the specific location where I'm from, but just know that I'm in Alaska. That's all I'll say. I am an avid hunter. When it's that season, that's my time. Outside of that, I work a normal 9 to 5 job just like everybody else. But hunting is my passion. It's the best hobby a man could have.
I mean, a real man. I've hunted and killed nearly every species of animal out here that is sported. Primarily for myself speaking, it would have to be the Alaskan moose, the black-tailed deer, the barren ground caribou, Alaskan peninsula brown bear, and so on. There's just too many to list, but those are primarily the ones I usually hunt for. When I hunt, I don't just pack up my gear on a Friday afternoon and spend the day there and then have coffee and go home. No, when I hunt, I'm there from the break of day until it gets dark. There is this one rule that the locals had passed on to me when I first moved out to Alaska years ago. No matter how good of a hunter you are, never, and I repeat, never stay in the woods past dark. Do not spend the night hunting these nocturnal creatures because you'll be the one being hunted. Now I know that may seem silly to some, but it really is the truth. A truth that I learned the hard way. Let me explain. This happened last September last year, in 2019, which is right peak in the middle of hunting season. This is 100% true. I am originally from northern Montana, so I'm used to the cold, and I've been hunting all my life. It's been a tradition that's been passed down from father to son for generations in my family. Now, I usually always go hunting alone. Sometimes I'll go with my buddy Bob. He's actually my neighbor and my best friend. I asked him to go with me this particular time last year, but he told me that he had the work. I was actually off this certain Friday. I don't remember exactly why I was off on that Friday, because I don't remember requesting the time off, but I was off, so the offer was there, but I ended up just going by myself. I had my rifle, my ammunition. I had gotten dressed and ate a hearty breakfast, tucked away my bowie knife, and of course just a few other essentials like water and things of that nature that I would use while I was out there throughout the day. There's a particular place that I really enjoy going to, and that's where I went. After I'd parked my truck and I made my hike into the woods, I took a 10 minute quick lunch and just relaxed and enjoyed the surroundings before I began my hunting. Fast forward a few hours. I mean, today was dead. There was nothing going on hunting-wise, at least. This was weird. Usually, I'm done within a few hours, but I feel like I've accomplished absolutely nothing. I've been out here all day, and I've barely even seen a buck. What's going on? I thought to myself. The surrounding brush and trees were thick, but not thick enough for me to notice that the sun was setting, and I was pretty deep in the woods by this point. I decided maybe it was time for me to turn around and start heading back to my truck. I don't want to be out here when it's dark. I didn't want to be out here in the dark, not because of what the locals had warned me about, but simply for the fact that I wasn't prepared to sleep overnight out here in the woods. I didn't bring a tent, I didn't bring anything of that nature. I'm not very superstitious. I don't believe in most of that mumbo jumbo stuff that people be telling me. Not unless I see it with my own two eyes. Well, all that was just about to change. I was following my tracks, heading in the direction back to my truck, when I started hearing things in the woods around me. It wasn't just my left, nor my right, nor behind me. It sounded like it was coming from all directions, which totally creeped me out. <laughs> what the hell was that? I said out loud to myself. I stopped in my tracks and spun around. There was nobody there. What the hell was laughing? Was it laughing at me? 
Who's there? Show yourself. You shouldn't be creeping on people that are hunting. You know that's not very safe to do, sir. Hello? Who's out there? Silence. No one or nothing responded to any of my shouts. It was as if I was just talking to myself. All became silent in the woods surrounding me. Not even the crickets were chiming. I suddenly had the weird urge that I was being watched. But by who or what? This has never happened to me before. This was a new experience for me, and I've been doing this for over 15 years. I was creeped the hell out at this point. All I wanted to do at this point was get the hell out of these woods and back to my truck to get home. I've had enough of this bullshit, whatever it is. I don't want any part of it. Where are you going? What? It, it echoed all around me. I slowed my pace and looked to my left and right again, but still, nothing was near me. Whoever the hell you are, just stop. Where are you? I'm right here. I didn't even have enough time to fully turn around to see this beast latch onto me with its arms. It sank its large teeth into the corner of my right shoulder. I screamed out of pain and misery and surprise all at once. This thing was huge, at least six and a half feet tall. It all happened so fast, I was struggling not to lose my balance on my feet because I knew if I fell down, this big beast of whatever the hell it was would have definitely taken my life quickly. I hunched over, oh, so painful. I screamed and shook and tried to squeeze out of its large grips, but I could not. I inched my fingers to my bowie knife on my belt and finally gripped the handle. I knew I only had one shot at this beast. I quickly rammed the knife between my arm and my rib cage into the beast's chest behind me. It let out a horrific howl that almost made my ears bleed. It released its grip, and I fell forward onto a nearby bush. My shirt was covered in blood between my arms. I must have sliced myself during the process. No, I wasn't cut at all. It was the blood from its teeth marks and its razor-sharp claws around my waists. Still, I was injured. I needed help, and fast. I kneeled down and grabbed my rifle from the ground. I spun around to shoot at it, but whatever it was was gone. The only evidence of a struggle was the blood on the dirt. I grabbed my cell phone from my jeans pocket and dialed my friend. I explained what had happened to me. I told him if I needed help. I needed an ambulance or for someone to drive me to the nearby hospital and fast. I felt like I was losing a lot of blood as my energy was slowly fading. I know what you're thinking. Why didn't you just call the police for an ambulance? Well, the police don't know where I was hunting. Bob knows where I go. Plus, he didn't work too far from where this was. Bob was there within the next 30 minutes. I met him at the parking lot barely able to stand as I leaned against the corner of the back bed of my truck. He rushed me to the hospital. I tried to answer as many questions as I could, but I know deep down he didn't really want to believe what I was telling him, but he did. Like I said, that happened last year. I don't go hunting anymore, and I refuse to go anywhere near those woods. Have you ever heard of the Dogman Hotel? Neither have I. That was, until I witnessed it for myself. 
The location of this mysterious hotel is set to be haunted. It's in the northeastern corner of Colorado. I won't give any specifics because I don't think it's my place to. That, and honestly, I don't remember. I was a kid when this happened, but I still remember most of it like it was yesterday. Like a bad dream. I remember we were on this road trip up north to Sydney, Nebraska to visit some family. We had been on the road for over eight hours and my parents were extremely tired. We stumbled upon this hotel on the way towards the borderline. I remember the building looking very dark and creepy, almost like a castle in some way. Very old. The driveway to this hotel was completely private from the main road. The trees were so densely thick, it was like 50-foot walls barricaded you towards the entrance of the hotel. I just remember staring out the window and seeing something in the woods on their way up there. I thought I saw glowing eyes in the brush, but it must have been just the, my imagination. I didn't pay it any mind. Like I said, I was a kid and I already had a wild imagination as it was, but I still remember seeing that when we first pulled up. It was good that they pulled out and got a hotel that night because it rained hard that night. There was some freak storm that nobody was aware of that just swooped through right in the area. The rain was so hard. You could hear it landing on the roof. You could hear it landing outside on the ground. The wind... The wind was winding around everything. You could hear it whistling in your ears. My parents were long past asleep. It was probably around 10.30 at night by this time. I couldn't sleep. I kept hearing howls and stuff outside. I was kind of creeped out after I saw those eyes in the brush from earlier that evening. I kept hearing these clapping noises coming from somewhere inside our room. This was a large room. These were like old school rooms, so they were almost like apartments in some way. Very fancy yet old. It's really hard to explain, but it was just larger than what we're usually used to. But I'm sure because of the location, it was probably fairly cheap. I know, I thought, well, you're just psyching yourself out, go to sleep. But in my gut, I knew I was right. There was something out there, maybe more than one thing, who knows. The wind got louder, and I started hearing the clapping sounds even harder now. I got up out of my bed and put on my slippers. I started hearing what sounded like some wild dogs barking. Then the wind started to die down. I walked over to the counter and grabbed the room key, put it in my pocket, and opened our room door. As soon as I opened our door, the sounds were twice as loud as before. Whatever was bothering me was somewhere outside in this hallway somewhere. Sure, I was scared. More confused than anything, I wanted to figure out what that noise was so I could finally get some sleep. I slowly closed the door, not trying to wake my parents. I made a left-hand turn in the hallway and slowly crept towards the edge of the wall. I quickly glanced back to see what the door number was, that way I would know which room was ours when I went back. Our room was number 7. That dang banging noise, the clapping, it was really loud at this point, and I noticed, finally, what it was. At the far end of the hallway on the second floor where our room was, was a large glass window. As I approached it, I noticed that the wooden doors were wide open, and that's what was flinging back and forth from the heavy wind from the rain. I leaned forward, trying to grab the wooden handles to close the damn window. And that's when I saw it. This large, black, bear-looking wolf, I don't know. 
It was just standing there in the middle of the tree line, just standing up like a man on its back two hind legs, just staring directly at me in the window. Its eyes, its eyes were like a bright amber yellow, almost like a reflection of a cat from a light. I can't explain it. This thing was pure blackness. It looked like a dog, but it looked like a man too. You must remember, I was still a child when I witnessed this, so I'm going off of a memory of like 15 years ago, but it still gives me nightmares. This thing was larger than my papa, and my papa's pretty big. This was more like a beast, a creature, something that you would read in a fairy tale. As soon as the lightning flashed the sky again, the thing was gone. It had completely disappeared from sight. One second it was there, and as soon as the flash came on again, it was gone. Nothing but cold winds and rain. I stood there in shock. My arms were getting wet from the wind and rain as I was still gripping onto the wooden handles on the door. I closed both doors and locked the window, slowly walking backwards, still stunned from what I had seen. I must have walked backwards the whole way back to my room. I swear, my whole body was shaking. It probably took me about ten tries to open the dang knob. I walked inside slowly, still stunned by what I had witnessed. I closed the door and locked it, not caring if they heard me at this point. I wanted to wake them up. I wanted to tell them what I'd saw. They woke up and turned on the lights, rubbing their eyes asking what the hell I was doing out of my room. I told them everything. It took a few tries as I was just mumbling and just so erratic I just couldn't calm down. I was freaked the hell out. I just wanted to expose and to list, let it all out at once and it was just, it was just too much. Too much for my little mind to handle. I couldn't grasp what I had witnessed. Eventually, I calmed down and explained the whole situation, beginning from what I had originally saw when we first pulled up to the hotel that morning. And of course, they didn't believe me. Oh, silly boy. You were just having a nightmare. Our little Billy. He thought he saw a wolf. A wolf man. A dog man. You're so silly. I am now 28, and I've done some research on my own. I found that hotel. It's no longer in service, of course. But I've read a lot of forms of other people seeing what I had seen. It is such a relief knowing that I'm not the only one who has seen things out there. I... I am not crazy. I was visiting my grandpa in Montana last winter. We always go out there for the holidays because it snows so much and it's so beautiful out there. My grandfather has a nice little two-bedroom cabin out there in the mountains. He's definitely not a city folk by any means. He is definitely introverted, and that's saying it nicely. Anyways, we were going to be out there for two weeks. I want to say the first week was just normal. It was great. We had hot cocoa by the fireplace. We stayed up listening to Christmas music and helped him decorate his tree in the living room. It was wonderful. He has two big St. Bernard dogs in the backyard, which I'm not sure why he picked those. I'm more of a pit bull person myself, but they were big softies and lovable dogs, if anything. They were just gorgeous. To give a visual, if you ever saw the 90s movie Beethoven, they looked just like that. My grandmother passed away last year. So it was just my grandpa and his two dogs at this point. 
I think the dogs were just there to keep him company, if anything. But the part I want to make out is that we're not sure if my grandmother had passed away, in all honesty. It's... it's really a mystery. She disappeared. She was out hiking in the woods with one of the St. Bernard dogs, and hours upon hours it went by. She never came home. The dog came back with a leash, alone. The police and officials came out, and even neighboring farms came out, helped trying to search the forest for, but nothing. Her tracks just stopped, disappeared. They never found my grandmother. Probably some wolves, or maybe a bear got her, or who knows. They never found any blood either, so there's really no explanation at all for what happened to my grandmother. But according to my grandfather, he believes that she is gone. It's kind of a touchy subject, so I'd rather not get into it, to be honest. After Christmas, we only had a couple of days left before we were flying back to California. On one of those last remaining mornings... I don't remember which day it was, to be honest with you. I decided to go on a hike. I love going on hikes. I can't stand running, but I could hike for hours, and plus the scenery out in Montana is breathtaking. It's gorgeous. There's a reason why most of the western movies are filmed out in Montana. It truly is God's country. I packed a little lunch, and I had my bowie knife with me just in case I come across any coyotes or any types of snakes or whatever. You know, just in case. I mean, we are out here in the wilderness. I had a bottle of water with me, as I would sip it periodically throughout my walk. The weather was great. It was definitely on the chilly side. Very cold. But it's okay. I was dressed for the weather. The snow was high, thick, and soft. I absolutely love the snow. I love everything about winter time. I swear, I live in California, but my soul is somewhere else. The sun was out without a cloud in the sky, yet it was extremely cold nonetheless. Perfect, I thought to myself. I had my inhaler with me, as I do have a slight case of asthma, and being that the elevation is pretty high out there where my grandpa lived, the air is thinner than usual. It was a beautiful, breathtaking hike. I was walking back towards my grandfather's cabin when I started hearing things around me. At first I thought maybe it was just some rodents or something scavenging for food somewhere on the snowbed. Maybe crawling up some trees, maybe some squirrels looking for a nut. Who knows? I didn't pay it any mind. The forest carries many forms of life, but this time, it carried life that I was unaware of. I swear in the distance behind me, I heard something calling my name, almost whispering it. Brandon. Brandon. I stopped for a second and turned around. There is nobody there. I shrugged it off. Maybe my grandfather was screaming out for me and for some reason I thought it was behind me. Which made utterly no sense at all, but I didn't think too much of it. I was just eager to get back and get out of the snow and get warm. Hey! That was it. I turned around and saw it. There was this large, black, furry silhouette of something at least 20 meters away from me in the wilderness. It was hiding behind some brush and a large tree trunk sticking out of the ground. It was almost like it was playing peekaboo or something, the way it was angled from outside of the back of the tree bark. It had pointy ears and glowing amber eyes. It looked like a wolf. But it... it wasn't. It was standing straight up hunched over. Judging by its height, it was definitely taller than I was. I've never seen anything like it before. 
Hell, animals don't speak. I was frozen in shock. What? What the hell is that? Finally, after a stare down about 20 seconds or so, of course I'm not counting, fight or flight mode kicked in. I turned around and started running through the snow as fast as possible back to my grandpa's cabin, screaming at the top of my lungs, trying to get anyone's attention at this point, just in case if this thing caught up to me. To my benefit, I don't believe this thing was chasing me. More like taunting me. I reached my cabin in a couple of minutes, rushed inside and told everybody what I had saw. Of course, my mom and dad didn't believe me. Hell, I wouldn't have believed me either. My grandfather was silent, with his arms crossed in front of his chest. Hmm, he replied, as he walked over to the fireplace and grabbed his rifle from above the fireplace. Whoa, where are you going, Grandpa? I'm going to go see what you're talking about outside, he replied. You guys stay here as he walked out the door and shut the door behind him. My heart was still racing. I was still extremely paranoid and scared at the same time. Now, I was freaked out and worried for my grandfather's safety. Whatever that thing was, was even bigger than he was, I swear. About 15 minutes had passed, and my grandfather walks back inside the cabin and locks the door behind him. He sat down next to me, holding his rifle in his right hand. Well, listen up everybody. We're going to be staying here for the night. Now Brandon, I didn't find any monster or man-wolf thing that you were talking about, but I'm not saying I do not believe you. No one truly knows what life truly exists in the forest. There's always new species that are being discovered throughout time. I will say this though for your benefit, I did find some very unusual large tracks out in the snow in the direction that you pointed to from the window. I've never seen tracks like that before. I have no idea what type of animal those belong to. So I believe you. Listen up everybody, let's just relax and just not overthink this situation. Let's cook an early dinner tonight, watch a movie, and then I'll take you guys to the airport tomorrow. Nothing to worry about. Let's just not go outside, just to be safe. Everyone agreed. The night was normal, aside from the howls. This happened last spring. My cousin Jimmy and I were going camping. You see, we live in Arkansas. I know a lot of people like to talk a lot of smack about our state, but realistically, it's quite beautiful and nice, and a great place to call home. It was a Saturday night. We only planned on doing a one-night sleepover as we wanted to get everything set up and got home by Sunday. We got there real early. We got the tent set up. All the meat prepped, everything was laid out on the picnic bench, and I cleaned off the grill from whoever was out there before. They left it a mess. It was disgusting. Fast forward into the night, and about a 12-pack of Budweiser later, we were feeling quite good. Plus, we ate like kings that night. So we were just jamming onto some country music, just enjoying ourselves. We decided just to call tonight at about 11.30, figured we might as well get up early to cook some breakfast on the grill. So after we packed everything up, well, mostly at least, everything meat related and everything was stayed in the cooler outside, we got in our tent and probably talked for another about 15-20 minutes of some drunkenness, and we finally passed out. I don't know what time it was, but I had woken up to some weird sounds outside of our tent. I looked over to Jimmy and... I noticed he was already awake, his eyes were wide open, but he was in total silence. 
I motioned to say something, but he just hushed me with his finger across his lips. Shh. I didn't make a sound. I just laid there and listened. Damn it, Jimmy! I'm sorry. Shh. I couldn't hold it anymore, he said, whispering. Were you just making those sounds up? I asked. No. There's something outside. Oh, come on. Come on now. I'm serious. Look. He pointed behind me. I turned around, and I saw the shadow of something peering in through the moonlight. Whatever it was, was hunched over, but it looked too tall. It was definitely taller than me, I'll tell you that, and I'm 5'11". It started making these grunt noises. Something that I've never heard of before. It was... It was wrong. It didn't sound like anything that we've ever hunted before. I'll tell you that much. It scared the daylights out of me. I swear. I couldn't move. I was so scared. I was desperately trying to find my gun and my jeans that I had folded up in the corner of the tent without trying to make any noise. It's not that easy without using a flashlight, of course. I eventually found it, checked it, and then I slowly walked over towards the zipper. I swallowed a gulp of whatever courage I had left. My cousin just nodded at me and just kind of gave me the approval to, you know, go for it, I guess. I slowly and as quietly as possible unzipped the tent at least halfway, enough for me to squeeze through and check my surroundings before fully hopping out. I was shaking in my boots, and I was barefoot. That just goes to show you how frightened I was. I slowly stood to my feet. I glanced around with my pistol, but I didn't see anything. But I heard it. I heard the howling of something very close by. Shortly after that noise, whatever you want to call it, there was no coyote. I started hearing these heavy footsteps. I could feel the vibrations beneath my feet. Whatever it was, was big, and it was close. I quickly turned around to look at my cousin Jimmy. He was halfway out of the tent. I started walking around the back of the tent to see if whatever it was may have been on the other side. And that's when I saw it. This beast of a man, whatever it was. It was on the edge line of our spot where we were camping. We've been hunting our whole lives, yet I've never seen this before. Just imagine a giant coyote. One that's pure black that stands like me, hunched over at least six feet tall, and full of fur, and full of fangs. The craziest thing about it was its eyes. Its glowing, amber-like eyes. It was as bright as the moon, or even more. It glared at me. It knew I was looking at it. I aimed. I got one shot at it. I don't know if I hit it, but as soon as I pulled that trigger, the damn thing was gone. My cousin quickly joined me. I explained everything that I saw to him, but he's still in disbelief. He just thinks that we were drunk, which is not necessarily a lie. We were definitely out there, but I know what I saw. I just can't explain what it was. My wife and I were camping this past weekend. This is something I just need to get off my chest and just lay it out there. I'm sick of holding it in. It was around 5 p.m. Maybe it was 4.30. I don't recall, to be honest. 
she was cooking on the grill. She was grilling up some of those marinated flat ribs that you could get from the Mexican market called Primo's out here where we stay. It's so amazing. It's perfect. I had a six pack of Corona Extra, and of course, she only had one. She's pretty much a sipper. That leaves five for me, which was plenty. I didn't want to get hammered, I just wanted to feel good for the evening. The only issue was, I didn't have any cigarettes. Now, I'm not a smoker, but when I drink, I enjoy a couple cigarettes. I guess it's pretty common for a lot of people. Not everybody, I would say, but typically, a lot of non-smokers do smoke when they're drinking. Ah, enough of this puff-puff pass talk. Let's get back to business. So fast forward, one of those Bluetooth speakers, and we were jamming to some old 80s, maybe early 90s Latin freestyle music. You know, like Cynthia and Johnny O. You're my dream girl. Da -da 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 dream. You know, I can't sing. Don't judge me. Anyways, we were jamming to some oldies. Eating good. We had the beers. We even had a couple of those lanterns hanging up on neighboring trees near our tent and the picnic table. We were really just having a great time together, as we usually do. Until we went to bed. That's when all hell broke loose. We were, you know, doing, doing our, our thing. thing. Oh yeah! We were pretty loud too, but our nearest camping neighbor was probably about 40 feet away from us. Basically, a spot past the one next to us as we had some gaps in between us. For some reason, it just wasn't packed like it usually was. That place is pretty popular, too. Not that I'd ever go there again, that is. So, regardless, we were making up as much noise as we wanted to because we felt like nobody could hear us anyways. But that's when we... we heard it. We heard... something... Whatever that thing was, it sounded like it was right outside of our tent. Now mind you, I don't own a gun. It's not that I don't believe in them, but we're in California and it's like, basically if you shoot an intruder, the intruder will sue you and they'll win. That's just the way it is. Our state sucks. All I had was a bowing knife. That's it. I thought that's all that we would ever need. You know, if we come across a snake or a little coyote that won't go away. This wasn't a coyote. This sounded huge. Its vocal tones were deeper than mine. And I'm a grown-ass man. But this wasn't a man. I don't know what it was. All I know is that we both sat up in our tent as quietly as possible and held each other, looking around, not knowing if the shadows that we were seeing were actually shadows or the shadows of this thing. My heart was beating so hard in my chest, I swear it was going to break through my rib cage in the sternum. I was completely terrified. It wasn't a bear. It wasn't a coyote. We don't get wolves out here. I don't know what the hell it was. My wife started sobbing, and I just put her head in my chest. I just whispered in her ear, just keep quiet. Whatever it is, it may just go away or maybe it's just hungry and it just wants our ice chest. Deep down inside, I knew I was really talking to myself. So we waited. We waited, which felt like an eternity. Realistically, it was probably only about 20 to 30 minutes. Constantly, this thing would just pounce back and forth. Its footsteps would vibrate around us on the dirt floor. Whatever it was was big. Bigger than us. A lot bigger. It sounded pissed. I heard whatever it was outside, destroying everything we had set up outside. I could hear it throwing all of our equipment around. And then... The ice chest... First, I heard the lid rip open. Then I heard all the bags and all the things being thumped around and gnawed on. This thing was eating everything we had. 
We had lots of stuff that we had prepped for morning breakfast. We were going to eat like kings. We had sausages and steak and bacon. We had the works. We were going to get our grub on. But that obviously wasn't going to happen. My wife started to sob some more. Then she was having a panic attack. But realistically, it was due to her asthma. I gave her her inhaler, and she inhaled two puffs. And that's all it took to give away our position to this thing. How do I know this, you may ask? Well, because it stopped whatever the hell it was doing out there with our crap. At that moment, I looked directly at it through its reflection from the vinyl tent wall. I could see the dark silhouette of this giant canine-like human. I never truly saw it. I never peeked through the zipper. All I could see was its glowing eyes through the vinyl. The glowing amber eyes staring right through my soul. The chase. My heart felt like it was going to burst. I couldn't stop running. If I stop running, I'll die. Fuck. Fuck. Fuck, it is gaining on me. I... I left my boyfriend behind as food for the bees. The... Wolf... Dogman... I don't know. Was it a werewolf? I didn't have a choice. My boyfriend's skin had already been loudly torn off, followed by an arm and a leg. He screamed loudly and pleaded with me to run. The sight of the blood. All that blood. I... I wish I hesitated or tried to help. As soon as the words were out of his mouth, I turned and ran as fast as I could. The last sight I saw of him was his head being ripped clean off and the burst of blood into the air. That, all that blood, I had to get out of there. I turned and ran away as fast as I could. The wolf man, whatever. Well, he didn't seem so bad when we first met him. We asked him for help. Did he have any spare matches or anything? He was so friendly, so kind, and invited us to stay near his cabin. We're new to hiking and camping real city slickers, and were happy for the help. My mum always hated camping, and always tried to keep me away from the woods. I've, I've always been drawn to them. She never said why. She was right. I never should have come here. I could hear the howling behind me. How could such a mild-mannered man turn into such a beast? Everyone heard of the werewolf legends. His eyes changed. The formerly mild-mannered former librarian had black fur burst from every part of his body. His muscles swelled and into those savage jaws. My boyfriend lost his life. I look back into the darkness and see those glowing yellow eyes, always getting closer. <sighs> my lungs, they felt like they were going to burst. I leaned with my back against a tree, hunched over and panting. I couldn't let him take me. I couldn't let him change me into something I am not. The wolf was gaining ground, almost mocking me, 
It could have killed me at any time. What was it doing? Finally, I fell. I sobbed and cried, trying my best to crawl away. I could hear it behind me. The breath of the beast as the moonlight allowed it to cast a shadow down over me. My stomach twisted. My chest was tight. I could hear it behind me. I simply could not go on anymore. Every muscle burned. Every limb ached. I was sure I was going to have a heart attack. I looked up into the sky. It was so different from before. I realized there was a change in me. You can never deny who or what you are. I threw away my glasses. The sky changed. The moon was so bright. So perfect. Da da. I. I could understand him. You can never deny what you are. You can never deny who you are. There's no point in trying. My body began to morph. Muscles bulged as fur roughly pushed from my skin. My clothing ripped, and I could not resist howling at the moon. Behind me, the wolf man. My father brought the corpse of my boyfriend over and I sank my teeth into him, ripping his mangled body even more apart. I was home. I was finally home. The Dark Man I met my best friend Ben when I was 19. We started a degree in music together and had absolutely nothing in common, which we loved about each other. What shocked us was how sync our childhoods had been. From being born two weeks apart to the age of 12, we shared a lot of experiences, even though we never met. I remember Ben telling me about a VHS he used to have, with Huxley Pig and Will Quack Quack cartoons on it, saying how obscure it was and how he loved it. I replied that I knew exactly which VHS he was referring to, and also still had a copy of it. This sort of thing happens a lot between us, so we like to quiz each other from time to time, then joke about how different we were from our identical upbringings. One night, I was staying over at Ben's house. We got on the topic of kids' ghost stories. I love creepy stories, but Ben hates them, so the conversation was slow, going at first. We started with the usual stories, kids in the neighborhood spread. It was funny how many of our town's stories were exactly the same, for being opposite sides of the city and the river. They're miles from each other. The dilapidated places were always haunted. We had both heard about the one-eyed black cat, nobody owns, that watches the children play out. The list of stories went on and did have similarities. Ben got surprisingly into the discussion. So, have you heard of this story? Exits, two which I confirmed all told my town slightly different version of the story. That's how the night progressed. After we exhausted the conversation he ended with. Even to this day, I'm still scared of the dark man. So please tell me, have you heard that story too? I just remember being dumbfounded, saying I had no idea what the dark man was. As far as I'm aware, the Dark Man story is in Ben's town. We tried looking on the internet, but Ben was too easily freaked out by the pictures and scary stories that popped up as we searched. The Dark Man really grabbed my attention. Usually, kids' ghost stories go into so much detail, like the color of the ghost dress, or the exact way the hair hangs off the ghost eyes. 
but there wasn't much information about the dark man. The details were vague. His words at the time were something like, the older kids who were allowed out on the streets told us about the dark man who stood around in the alleys at night, and the older kids were shamelessly scared to go there and it got dark. Obviously, it was thugs or druggies, I explained. But he was adamant. No, because they ran away when they noticed the kids watching them. They climbed up the high walls of the back alley, into people's backyards, very fast, without making a noise. The older kids wouldn't talk about it, unless pushed. He said the feeling seemed too real to make a joke to scare the younger kids. His childhood friend Wes claimed he saw one too. The story goes to the dark man, who would be found standing in small groups, or more often solitarily, in the middle of an alley, looking for scraps of food, not doing much else. Ben seriously thinks he saw one of his mom one day, walking back from the shops, Apparently, it was in a fenced-off area where the block of flats had been demolished a few years earlier. At the opposite side of the land, he saw a skinny, hunchbacked man cupping his hands full of water from a steam which ran through the plot, washing his long greasy hair, almost ritualistically. Even though he didn't see the homeless man's face, he was quite far away to make out details. He swears something about the man wasn't quite human. I blame the child's imagination and memories, but he swears it. He showed me the area that next morning. If he and his mother are remembering correctly, I have no idea why even a homeless man would wash his hair in a dirty stream. I first met Wes a few weeks after the night I learned about the Dark Man, and didn't hesitate to ask for his first-hand account of the Dark Man. It was the main reason I decided to meet him, after all. His description was similar to Ben's, but his encounter was far more close up. Wes lived further from the local corner shop than Ben and used to take a shortcut through an alley when he walked there. The wheelie bins were out that day. He said he could hear a cat or dog feeding on the discarded food behind one of the bins. It happens a lot, and everyone knows to keep a distance, so the dog won't get aggravated and attack. But Wes said the dog didn't look right. He only got a quick glance before it ran behind the wall with a rotten, roast chicken hanging from its mouth. According to his memory, it was running more like a hyena than a normal dog, with its shoulders held much higher than its hips. The snout was too short, and the ears were more elfin than a dog's. He can't remember if the creature had fur on us, but it was definitely naked. Not long after, he overheard the older kids talking about the dark man and realized what he saw. I like Wes, but he has doubting attitudes akin to me, and admitted his story may have been influenced by other kids' stories. It could have been a normal duck struggling to carry a whole chicken away after being startled. The story lay dormant, not mentioning for months after I spoke Wes. In that time, I had moved away, and have only managed to visit Ben three times since then. The last time I met with him, we decided to go to the local takeaway, in the early hours of the morning, and I got my very own encounter of what could have been a dark man. Right on the same abandoned plot, where Ben saw the homeless man bathing, there was a decent side fire burning. It could have been possibly three silhouettes huddled around the flames. Ben's area is pretty rough, so it isn't an unusual sight. 
but I don't know how to describe it. Those figures weren't moving naturally. My view wasn't great, because Ben wouldn't move closer than we were, but I swear, those silhouettes never stood completely upright. We watched them for about five minutes. They were hunched over with their backs to us, warming their gloves behind the fire with the hoods up. I remember one of them moving closer to the fire while keeping its hands on the ground. It could have been easier just to stand and walk closer, but it shuffled awkwardly, using its arms. Everything about the movements was indescribably awkward. I was so excited. It had to have been a dogman. I didn't want them to spot us, so we left pretty soon after. But I forced Ben to visit the bonfire with me the next day. It was just a milk crate, set next to the charred circle on the ground. Nothing to prove these beings were inhuman. Strangely, there were bones in amongst of the smoldering papers and branches that had been burning the night before. We could make out to the handprints, where at least one of the homeless people had presumably crawled directly over the child ground. The trail of handprints led away from the bonfire and faded after a couple of meters. That was all we found. We walked away, feeling slightly silly, laughing at how we'd probably been stalking a trio of drunk tramps. However, Ben's realization unnerved us terribly. As the hand trail faded, he pointed out a large paw print becoming more and more prominent in the middle of the fading handprints. Then it struck me why I found the gate so weird the night before. As a man had walked closer to the fire, he placed his feet exactly in the same spot his hands were been. We stared in shock, not sure what to make of the trail. Then the yelps and growls of dogs fighting came from a bush uncomfortably close to us. I'm not ashamed to say we ran away, crapping ourselves. Maybe it was just a pack of dogs. We didn't care to look, and I'm never going back there to find out. So the officer and I went out there to... to take a look at it. And you know... He just tried to chew in around the doors. And you could see a dog print outside on a window there, so you know it was obviously a dog. Somewhere in the north woods darkness, a creature walks upright, and the best advice you may ever get is never to go out at night. A very strange thing happened after the poem was aired on radio on April 1st, 1987. And it became obvious the story was not going to fade away. The first two times the song was played, there was no viewer reaction or calls. Cook and O'Malley were prepared to let the failed prank die when the phone lines started lighting up. People were calling in, asking about the weird song. Listeners asked, Who did that song on the Dogman thing? And, When are you going to play it again? O'Malley took a call from an elderly man who stated that he was chilled to the bone after hearing the song because he had actually seen a similar creature years before. That was the first of many sighting reports that would pour into the station over the next few weeks. Scores of people told the stories and encounters with a creature that was very much like Cook's fabricated Dogman. Within one month, The Legend of the Dogman became the most requested song on air and for a short time was added into the regular rotation of music. 
other stories began to surface and be compared to the Michigan Dogman story. A century-old, mysterious Indian legend revealed shocking similarities. A French fur trader's diary from 1804 told of an encounter with Loup Garou. A letter from 1857 described a creature that stood upright like a man, yet bore the countenance of a gray wolf. A real dogman sighting investigated by Lake County Sheriff's Deputy Jeff Chamberlain, who was accompanied by Department of Natural Resource Officer Ron McCarty, was picked up and reported on by Mark Marionette, a reporter for the Cadillac Evening News. Then other news outlets began to pick up the story, and it was later fed down the Associated Press Newswire, and thus was picked up by newspapers all across America. It was even mentioned as a strange coincidence in Paul Harvey's National News and Comments broadcast. McCarty called the TV station, WTCM, stating that he and Chamberlain had openly joked about how this sighting would fit with the seventh year prophecy made in that song. McCarty's voice would later appear in the beginning of the 10th anniversary version of the song, The Legend 97. Suddenly, The Legend soared into national prominence and became a hit song once again, only this time on a much larger scale. Requests for copies came in from all 50 states and all around the world. Eventually, the master tape never consisted of the real value. It had been destroyed, and Steve Cook went into the studio again, this time with an upgraded keyboard, and recorded the song a second time. A few changes were made to the lyrics to update the legend for the summer. When it was finished, the second mass recording was shipped to Southfield, Michigan for mass production. The first 500 copies arrived a week later, and sold out in just 12 days. The legend had quickly become a hot property, with record stores and radio stations across the country calling the station requesting copies. A large record company offered to record and promote the song, and Steve Cook faced the difficult decision of whether to release the legend on a national scale or keep it local and manageable. Steve chose to keep it local. The music and lyrics were copyrighted by Mind Stage Productions. Cook's marketing and advertising company. More and more copies of the tape, which was originally priced at $3, were sold in the fall of 1987. WTCM held an art contest which allowed amateur artists the chance to submit works depicting what they thought the dogman would look like. There were over a hundred entries. Some were exceptional, but by far the most chilling and dramatic was an 11 by 17 charcoal sketch done by Brian Rowinski, who was only 23 years old at the time and never had a formal art lesson. The song was never intended to be a marketable vehicle for profit, and Cook made the decision early on that any profits earned derived from its sale would be donated to charity. The first charity was the Traverse City Cherryland Humane Society, which scored $2,500 towards drilling a new water well and the remodeling of an adult dog facility, which included new floor and tiles and pins. In 2001, Cook was introduced to Brian Manley, founder of AC Paw, a no-kill animal rescue program that specializes in lost causes. AC Paw takes in animals that have been injured, abused, or neglected or that have used up the maximum boarding time in traditional facilities and are about to be euthanized. They rehabilitate animals through a unique foster care network and eventually place them in a loving home. Cook was so impressed with the AC Paw program, he shifted all donations from the proceeds of the legend to their cause, and thus the legend of the Dogman's legacy lives on for animals in need. While the legend has never been formally distributed for airplay on other radio stations, it's been heard across the USA and the world. Many young adults grew up hearing it and remember it scaring them at summer camp. The legend has inspired movies, screenplays, stage productions, numerous books, term papers, at least one master thesis, and countless classroom projects at all grade levels. 
in spite of the initial belief that the song would be a radio bit designed to run one day only. Interest in the legend continues to grow. Steve Cook receives 10 to 20 reported sightings each year, many supported by dramatic evidence. Perhaps the best description of the legacy of the legend came from WTCM morning host Jack O'Malley. This song has been firmly woven into the fabric of northern Michigan. It's part of the culture now, part of the folklore. The legend will be here long after we are gone. The Gable Film In an estate cell, an old film was found in a box. After viewing it, a home video of a strange attack was discovered. The film shows a young boy filming normal family stuff, until a truck rides past a field showing a creature of some sort. They stop the truck and film the creature until it charges to attack. The attack is somewhat caught on tape and even shows the mouth of the animal. The mouth rules out ape or dog origin. Some people claim this is the dog man. Encounters Big Rapids, 1961 When I was a boy, my father was the night watchman at a manufacturing plant located in a rural area between Big Rapids and Chippewa Lake. Our house, which if I can remember right, was a perk of the night watchman job. It was across the street from the factory. The plant building was right next to it, with a large wilderness area of state land. At that time, it was simply known as Haymarsh, but, but now it's officially called Haymarsh State Game Area. We didn't understand it at the time, but Dad was always very skittish about letting us play outside after dark. He would sometimes talk about hearing coyotes or bears roaming around in the Haymarsh when he was out walking the perimeter of the building at night. But then one night in the summer of 1961, Dad walked back to the house to sit on the porch and have a cup of coffee and a sweet roll. He had a good view of the entire plant property. He saw some movement near a chain-link fence behind the building. He said it was approximately 3 a.m., so he felt quite sure this person wasn't there by accident. So he drew his gun and he watched for a few minutes, and that's when he noticed there was not a person there at all, but, but something much taller. He said it appeared to be covered by brown or gray hair. He had very broad shoulders and a powerful chest. It alternated between walking on four legs then standing up on two. He said it seemed to be looking for something along the driveway. He later said he couldn't quite believe what he was seeing. He quietly moved into the house and grabbed his Kodak Signet 35mm camera, which was his pride and joy. At this point, I should mention that Dad was quite the photography buff. His father had owned one of the first camera stores in Ohio. And Dad got the shutterbug from Grandpa. As he stepped onto the front porch, the creature moved slowly along the driveway, directly under the lights. He adjusted the camera for long exposure, held it as still as he could. He said he was shaking pretty bad by then and snapped a picture. I've enclosed a print in this letter. Dad said after a few seconds later, it, the thing dropped back down on all fours and slowly moved off into the woods. He sent a print to the local newspapers and sent copies to several magazines. One that, I think, was called Styrion, published the photo in their spring issue of 62. Dad had a copy of the magazine for years, but, eh, but it was misplaced after he left. still have the negative strip that contains this image. If you would like to have someone examine it. I also still have Dad's Kodiak Signet. I haven't shot any pictures with it for several years, but pretty sure it still works. Sparta. 1987. One weekend back around fall 1987, my two best friends and I were staying at my family's cabin, which is not far from the small town of Sparta, about 
20 minutes north of Grand Rapids. Anyway, my two friends left for dinner while I stayed behind in the cabin. Following the dinner, the two men headed back towards Sparta and the cabin. What happened next would shock and disturb them for years. It was dark and they were on a rural world. It was dark and they were on a rural road. Suddenly both of them saw something standing by the side of the road. In the headlights of the car, it appeared to be a human-like figure covered in gray fur. As they got closer and passed the figure, both of them got a very good look at it. It was the size of a man, and it stood on two legs, but it was covered head to toe in gray fur, and had a wolf-like head. It even raised its hands and seemed to snarl at them as they drove by. They said it looked like a werewolf right out of a Hollywood movie. My two friends didn't dare stop. They continued driving, and of course, they were peppering each other with questions. Did you see that too? Was that a dog? Was that someone dressed up in a costume? And so on. As they were having this animated conversation, they passed the sign that says, Welcome to Sparta, and drove through the small town on Main Street, and continued on out of the town in the direction of my cabin. The conversation about what had just happened continued when both of them looked up at the same sign. Their conversation about what had just happened continued. When both of them looked up to see the same sign, Welcome to Sparta sign, again, followed by the same main street that they had just drove through only moments ago. They hadn't stopped or turned around. They had been traveling on the same road in the same direction, but somehow, without any noticeable interruption in their journey, they had somehow been sent backwards several miles. Until this point, it would be easy to dismiss this as some sort of joke. However, the time displacement characteristic is what set this encounter apart. While such things are well documented in UFO and alien abduction stories, it's something we have not seen before in the Dogman sighting reports. I remember when they finally showed up at my cabin. They arrived no later than what I expected them to, around 9pm or so, and I remember how animated they were about their strange encounter. But I just assumed that they'd seen a large dog or were telling an embellished story to get a laugh. But 20 years later, both of them still insist that this was no joke. I have no idea what to make of the story. Maybe it was just some teenagers in a werewolf costume playing pranks. And did my friends really experience lost time afterwards? Or did they just make some wrong turns on their drive and didn't notice because they were distracted? I have no idea, but I would love to know if anyone else has seen similar things in the Sparta area. The area around Reed City, Michigan has been a hotbed of dogman activity. This report details an event that occurred nearly 20 years ago, but the witnesses remember it like it was yesterday, and is unshakable in her story. Her name is Courtney, and her encounter took place during the winter of 1993-94. to Courtney was a teenager at the time, and was sneaking cigarettes behind her parents' home near Todd Lake, northeast of Reed City. The sun was setting on a clear, cold winter day. Courtney was facing a large abandoned barn on the property next door. The barn always kind of spooked me. It was filled with rusty old equipment. The outer planks were all rotten and it sagged and leaned in every direction. My dad said to stay away, as the whole thing could collapse. On that evening, I was standing about 50 feet from the barn and I saw sunlight coming through the gaps in the siding. Courtney took her eyes off the barn for a few minutes, then something caught her attention again. There was some movement. The light flickered, but I couldn't really tell what it was. Then it turned its head back and looked straight at me. It was at least six feet tall, if not more. It had a dark color had a dog-like appearance, pointy nose and ears, and was really big. Courtney dashed into her house to grab a flashlight. When she returned outside, she shined it toward the barn door, but the animal was no longer there. She walked closer to the barn to look for tracks in the heavy snow. When she didn't see any, she realized the creature might still be inside, and ran back to safety near her house. She never saw the creature again. She later talked to a neighbor who had seen something. 
the size of a buffalo, but the shape of a dog. In the same barn a few months before Courtney's encounter. The neighbor said she had been so frightened by it she was in hysterics for near days. Her father had taken his gun and searched the barn, but found nothing there. At the time of these events, neither of the girls had heard the legend song and did not know about the Michigan Dogman legend until years later. Waters Meet, 1994 This report comes to us from an anonymous contributor who grew up in Cheboygan County, but spent many summers camping on family property in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. This encounter took place in an area of Watersmeet, home of the famous Paulding Lights phenomenon. Oddly enough, the Paulding Lights are also known as the Dog Meadow Lights. I was 13, I had just gotten some new rollerblades for Christmas, and since the main road where our property sits is paved, I couldn't wait to ride around. I went blading by myself and stopped to rest for a second. On this road, the woods are so thick, there's not much space between the road and the woods in most parts. And I remember seeing trees pushed down on the road that my dad said was done by bears. He was an avid bear hunter after all. But I remember not hearing any of your normal sounds of nature, not even birds. The air was still, and the sky was dark. I was deciding to turn back when I heard a rustling behind me. And something emerged from the left side of the road. I assumed it was a deer, but I paused and made myself as quiet as I could so I could watch it. I slumped down on my stomach in the middle of the road. It was about 600 feet ahead of me. When I got myself settled in the road, I watched it. I realized that what I was looking at wasn't a deer, it was on all fours with gray or brownish kind of fur. At first I feared the worst, thinking a bear caught my scent, until I saw its outline and color, and I thought I was looking at a dog, but I realized the face was too primitive, like a fox or coyote, you know? At this point in my life, I had never seen a wolf in real life and was too far for me to even tell the face exactly. The Michigan Department of Natural Resources has always recognized that wild wolves still roam the Upper Peninsula, although they were thought to be in a very limited number and only in extremely remote areas. It is conceivable that this witness was seeing one of these wolves, but then something very strange happened. It extended its front legs. In the slowest, longest seconds of my life, it stood up on its hind legs and sniffed the air and walked for about five steps, then got back down on all fours and walked to the other side of the woods, and it just disappeared. I don't remember how long I laid in the middle of the road, staring at the empty space. I saw this thing stand like a human. I remember my jaw hanging down as low as it could, but there was a pool of drool on the cement under it. When it finally clicked in my mind that perhaps I should rollerblade my butt back to camp as quickly as I could. The witness reports that while the creature never stalked or pursued him, he slept very little the rest of the night. He never told anyone about what he had seen, fearing he would be ridiculed. At the time of the sighting, he had never heard the legend song either, and would not hear it until 2004. He moved to Southern California in 2008, and has no interest in camping ever again. Alpina, 2001 My dad and I have a story to tell about our encounters with the dog man. My dad's story took place in the mid-70s. There was a cemetery behind the Alpena High School and a woody area behind that. There are many trails that run through here and in these areas, the place is called the Sandies. Where all the young kids would go to party, you know? My dad and two of his buddies were in a canoe in broad daylight paddling from the Sandies to the back of the cemetery. The banks of the river are 10 to 12 feet high in places, and some trails run right through the edge. The three of them saw what looked to be like a big dog running behind them on the trail. They didn't pay much attention to it until they heard a splash. When they looked, it was swimming after them. It went from 
a dog paddle to the chest and front legs coming out of the water and wading after them. They decided right then not to wait around to see what it was. Honestly, I thought it was BS at the time, and I'm still not even sure to this day it wasn't something they had been smoking or drinking. Then around 2001 to 2, I was leading some friends through the Sandy's trails. I used to like taking people out there without a flashlight and tell them that my dad's scary story to freak them out. The girls were freaked out before we even got into the woods, so I decided not to scare them that night. In the river are small, several islands connected by a small sliver of land. And at that time, there were three such islands chained together, and I, and I took them through the last one, which was planted with pine trees and nice even rows. I was the first one back there, about 30 seconds ahead, when one of the girls got her foot hung up on something. As I was going back to help her, there was a spot where the trees made this sort of roof effect, which was really cool looking at night with the moon shining through it and all. I thought at that point that I saw something. I'm not sure what it was, but it sent me running at double time. When my buddy saw my face, he didn't say a word, he just followed, both of us dragging the girls behind us. When he asked me later why I came out in such a hurry, I told him it was because I thought I had seen something at the other end of the island, walking through the trees, and it was very tall, but not likely a human. He may not have believed me, but he never questioned it either. Look, I'm still not sure what I saw, but it could easily have been that I just scared myself with my dad's story and was seeing things, but I know this. I still don't like the dark. And even though I love hunting, I hate going out before the sun comes up during deer season. Menden, 2007. The sighting report is told secondhand by a brother-in-law of the witness. The witness is a prominent person in local government and wishes to remain anonymous. The situation started last Saturday night around midnight when he was coming home from a friend's house in Benazona and taking the way back home to Traverse City. He stated that while traveling down Cinder Road, several miles outside of the town of Benden, he observed a pair of eyes reflecting off his headlights ahead of him. Thinking that it was probably a deer along the side of the road, he began to slow down. As he got closer, however, he stated that the object was much larger and darker than a deer. He said by this time, he had slowed down to around 30 miles an hour, and it was at this point he was several hundred feet from the creature, but it still hadn't moved. As he approached further, he stated that the only way he could describe the creature was being similar to a very large and dark wolf. However, he observed that this thing wasn't on four legs, but, but upright on his back two legs, near a roadkill deer. He estimated the creature stood a little over six feet tall and had very dark fur. He stated that by now, he was going slow enough to bring his truck to a stop in the road and observe the creature which had not moved even now and was still just staring at him. He told me that for a brief second he believed that the object was a giant stuffed animal that was put there as a kind of joke due to the fact that he had never seen anything like it in his life, and that was why he was able to drive up as close as he was without it moving an inch. He told me then, however, that before he could finish that thought, the creature then dropped to four legs and sprinted across the road and disappeared into the woods on the other side of the roadway. He told me that he stayed frozen in his seat for a minute solid, wondering, in the middle of the road, just what the heck had happened. I had jokingly asked him if he had been drinking that night, and with a deadly serious face he stated, No. Whatever that was, it was for real. As perplexed as he was that night over what he had seen, he was deathly afraid to go wandering into the woods to investigate further. He said that, using a flashlight, he observed an animal's tracks leading into the woods on the opposite side of the road and was fortunate enough that night to have his digital camera with him. He showed me a photograph of the paw print, which appeared to be about 7 or 8 inches long. He had another picture of the same paw print where he had placed a shotgun shell into the middle of it for scale. He told me that he was lucky that the side of the road was so soft because he wasn't willing to go any further than two or three steps from the door of his truck to get a picture. I inquired if the animal had made any sounds before it disappeared and he said that he did not hear it make any noise 
and if it were not for the picture, he would have thought he had just imagined the whole thing. I asked him if he could have seen a bear, and he stated, absolutely not. He bear hunts every year in the Upper Peninsula, so he obviously knows what a bear looks like up close. Anyway, that's his story, so believe it if you like it. If I didn't know him as well as I do, and hadn't seen the pictures, I would have said that he was just out of his mind. I've heard the song and know some of the stories, but I always believed it was just for entertainment value. After this, though, I'm looking at it all under a whole new light. Fontaine, how long have we been doing this? I shift and press the accelerator, surging the 67 Impala forward, the enormous red woods lining the sides of Route 101 whipped by in a blur. Depends when you start counting. To be a wise-ass Morgana. I shoot a glare at the linebacker of a man sitting in the passenger seat. A long time ago, a nasty supernatural experience gave me low-level telepathy, but I don't need to read his mind to know he's using my full name just to get under my skin. Hell, I don't know, Maurice, about five years? He nods in agreement. And in that time, have I ever steered you wrong? Grudgingly, I shake my head. Exactly. He crosses his arms to acknowledge his victory. So believe me, you don't fuck around with the wolf man. Which is exactly what we're about to do. He shifts uncomfortably. Probably. Yes. You scared? Terrified. His coffee-colored face is deadly serious. You should be too. I roll my eyes. Wolfman. Why don't you call it a werewolf like normal people? He shrugs. Different things. Pretty wide variety of werewolves. Everything from Indian skinwalkers to idiots who sell their soul to the right demon for a belt or a ring. But what's the difference between that and a wolfman? Maurice stares ahead, but his mind is far away. Everything. Werewolves gain a wolf's instinct, but keep their human mind. They can change back and forth. Easy as taking off the magic doodad. Wolf men are a different animal completely. They look like humans most of the time, but they ain't. He turns to me, expression grave. Wolf men are where the full moon comes in. Three nights a month, the human part is torn away, and what's left is the closest thing to death incarnate you're gonna find. Silver's the only thing that can hurt him, and even that barely. Try getting a kill shot with 800 pounds of fur, claws, and fangs trying to rip your throat out. He shudders. I've known guys torn to shreds trying to take down the wolf man. Close casket funerals, every one. But the worst is if you somehow manage to survive an attack. Maurice shakes his head. The stories have that part right too. You get bit, scratched, and it gets passed to you. Happened to a guy I partnered with a couple times, the name of Pat Campbell. Found out he put a silver bullet through his skull not long after. Seems a little dramatic to me. Yeah? He raises his eyebrows. Fontaine, wolfmen are a danger to everyone around them. The beast puts a rage in them, a bloodlust whole lot of battered spouses out there thanks to the much they're shackled up with. And that's what the moon ain't for. When it is, there's always a chance their loved ones will accidentally stumble on them in the wolf mode. Imagine waking up to find the people you most care about torn to bloody pieces by your own hand. Pat had a wife, three kids. He knew what had happened one way or the other. Figured it'd be less painful for everyone if he just ended things before it did. Maurice looks at me. Is that what you call dramatic? My only response is to edge the speedometer needle further to the right, the afternoon sun beginning its low descent towards the horizon. Maurice falls silent and leans back in his seat, point made. It's getting on towards six o'clock when I finally feel the mental tickle I've been waiting for. Here. Maurice sits up as I guide the car to an off-ramp onto the broken asphalt of the local road. Maurice says nothing, experienced enough with my clairvoyance to trust my judgement. The redwoods seem even taller as we continue, their gargantuan height blocking out the waning sun and trapping us in a kind of artificial twilight. After a couple of miles, a worn, single-story building appears around the bend, a weather-beaten sign out the front naming it Lou's Place. My telepathic pings flare, so I pull into the gravel lot and kill the ignition. I close my eyes and concentrate, reading what I can from the structure. A blood-red cloud engulfs my vision as the sweet scent of prey clings to my nostrils. An orb of brilliant silver shines bright overhead. It calls to me, and I drown in its song. Yeah, this is the place to start. We sure there isn't a history around here, Maurice? Nah, Morg. Not much of one, at least. Past few years, I've had a few unexplained deaths around the time of the full moon, but no pattern. Not like the last six months, anyway. A rash of killings have attracted us out west. 
Over the last half year, every full moon has brought more bodies. Every one horrifically flayed, mauled, partially eaten, violated. Almost 50 spread over as many square miles of Humboldt County. The local authorities don't know what to think, but Maurice and I have a pretty good idea. Well, let's see what Lou could tell us. I step out of the car, my heavy boots crunching in the gravel. Dark hair rippling in a light breeze that carries the invitingly earthy smell of the surrounding forest. Maurice follows close behind, his large frame and imposing presence. I don't need him, but it's nice to have backup when the going gets crazy. Maurice places a hand on my arm as I reach out to touch the door. Remember, Morgan, no matter what we get here, tonight is strictly recon. It's a full moon, and if it is a wolf man, anything more would be suicide. Got it, you big baby. Now stop worrying and let's get to work. I shove past him and push my way inside. The tap room is as dingy as I'd expected, and completely lifeless save for the old man tending the bar, absently wiping its chipped surface with a stained rag. I saunter up and perch on one of the stools, Maurice lowering his bulk beside me. The bartender gives us a look, first of surprise, and then concern, before quickly hiding it behind a mask of seeming nonchalance. Will it be, darling? I resist the urge to roll my eyes and glance over the unimpressive line of half-empty bottles behind him. Bourbon. Double. Rocks. Whatever's cheap. He nods. New big fella? Just seltzer. Lime, if you got it. The man moves to fetch the drinks. He's nervous about something. Anxiety practically sweating off of him. I lean into the bar. Lou, is it? He nods almost imperceptibly. Ice clinking softly in the glass as he pours. Been here a while? Uh, yep. Gone on about 25 years now. Huh. Long time. So what do you know about wolfmen, Lou? I mentally pick up a shot of sheer panic ripped through the man an instant before the glass shatters on the floor. I'm actually surprised how well he keeps his composure as he turns back to us. You need to leave. I throw him a winning smile. Lou, my man, you leave all the ladies this unsatisfied? Get out. His face cracks, the fear behind his eyes pouring through. Please, you don't know what you're walking into, darling. I open my mouth to respond. Oh, I think I do. Come on. Maurice stands and holds me to my feet, pulling me towards the door. Hey! I awkwardly stumble outside, even the pre-twilight intense after the dim recesses of the bar. What the fuck, Maurice? Real subtle, Morgana. Whatever, man. Just get off me. I'm going back. He lets me go. No. I'm pulling seniority. What the fuck? Maurice shakes his head. No point. We know enough. This guy is obviously involved with whatever's going on. You picked that much up from your first vision, yeah? I nod, reluctantly. Okay. Now, his reaction tells us the right on about a wolf man. We stick here trying to get more info, he might give it to us. Sure. Or... His eyes shift to the full moon slowly beginning to rise above the treetops. We could throw a wrench at things. So instead, we're gonna go ditch the car, get loaded up, and come back to see what happens. If nothing goes down because you already messed it up, we can always question him later. His brow shifts. Any objections? I respond with a sneer, but stay silent. I know he's right. He smiles. Glad you're on board. We get in the Impala and I crank the ignition. The car sends up a spray of gravel as I throw it in reverse and peel out onto the road. After about a quarter mile, I spot a worn deer trail and turn into the wood line. Wordlessly, I exit the car. Maurice joins me at the trunk and we go about readying our weapons. Two silver-coated knives clip onto my belt, six inches long and carrying a serrated edge. I pull my long duster back to see the Smith & Wesson in the holster I'm wearing, the revolver loaded with 38 silver bullets I cast myself. Maurice has donned a custom leather bandolier. He situates the machete over one shoulder, the blade specially treated with silver, the same as my knives, and a double-barreled shotgun over the other. Extra silver slugs line the crossed belts wrapped across his chest. We exchange a nod and slip into the trees back toward Luz. Once we get inside of the building, we hunker down and wait for something interesting to happen. It doesn't take long. After maybe 20 minutes, an old junker screams down the road, pulls into the lot, and practically runs into the wall of the bar. An unremarkable looking man jumps out, stopping briefly to untangle himself from the seatbelt before ducking inside. I close my eyes and extend my senses. It's hard to pick up any precise thoughts from the man, he's so blinded by fear and rage. I do manage to capture the image of a woman, blonde hair and snarls, 
face red and ugly from crying, but nothing more. The man stays inside for maybe three minutes, muffled sounds of shouting reaching us, even as far away as we are, before he stumbles outside to the car and roars off back the way he came. I raise my eyebrows at Maurice, who shrugs. Come on. I pull my pistol free as we cautiously make our way to the entrance bar. Maurice rests his hands on the machete handle and steps inside as I follow close behind. Lou is sprawled out on one of the bar stools, several of the formerly half-empty bottles now completely drained and littered about him. I moved to the old man. I never did get my bourbon. His quiet laugh does little to cover a sob. So sorry, darling. I went and drank it all. Knew the jig was up when you started asking questions. What's going on, Lou? Suppose it doesn't matter now. Reckon you were probably watching the place, saw my buddy Larry. Tried to call him, told him not to come. But he was already on his way here early on account of those bastards. He stops, finds a not quite empty bottle, takes a drink. Biker gang, call themselves Sons of Romulus, operate out of an abandoned pot grow a bit north of here. Outlaws, no regard for anything, always been a little off. The last few months they've been downright sadistic, abducting people, left and right. Everyone knows, everyone's too scared to do anything. Well, earlier today they took Larry's ex-wife right out of her kitchen. Neighbours in her 70s saw the whole thing, called Larry, wish she hadn't. Takes another drink, kills the bottle, and drops it. He came here hoping I'd help get her back. I feel for her. Lacey's a sweet gal and God only knows what those fucks are doing to her, though I can probably imagine. Even bodies have been piling up. He sighs. <sighs> but even if I weren't so fucked up, I still wouldn't go. Sons, they're unnatural. Got abilities. But even that ain't it. It's... He trails off, his eyes flicking to the pale moon shining brightly through the dirty bar window. The wolf. Maurice's voice is quiet, practically a whisper. Lou doesn't speak, but the abject terror on his face is enough. Maurice moves to the door. Let's go. I rush to catch my partner as he steps outside. Hey. Lou calls after us. Hey, wait. I ignore the old man, Maurice's long strides practically forcing me to jog as he walks back towards the stashed car. What the hell are we doing, Maurice? Going to help that woman. And this Larry guy. Obviously. One of those bikers must be a wolfman. Maybe more than one. We know the direction of their headquarters and... With luck, your talent will be able to guide us in. Yeah? What happened to just recon tonight? Anything else is suicide, huh? Morgan. His look is pained. You know better than anyone what it's like to be helpless and trapped with monsters in the dark. Past terrors flash through my mind. Cold red eyes burn into my soul as I'm lost in a living fog. Memory shifts, and I'm lying paralyzed in a room of white, the sounds of choked screams echoing nearby. Damn it. Fine. In and out, assuming Lacey isn't dead already, we get her and get gone. Agreed. And for the record, I think this is a stupid idea, and it's your fault if it blows up in our faces. You can say I told you so. That'll make me feel so much better when we're dead. Maurice smiles lightly. As long as you're happy. I only sneer in response. We reach the Impala and are back on the road in short order, moving in the direction we saw Larry fly off. We drive for a couple of miles, just enough for me to start hoping my telepathy won't pick anything up when I catch the barest whiff of the oily, mental stench I've come to associate with malignant supernatural entities. With a curse under my breath, I shove down my better judgement and follow. Ten miles and several turns later, the scent is so strong it's nauseating. I pull to the side of the road and look to my partner. We're close. This is your circus, chum. What's the plan? Maurice pauses for a moment, considering. Lou mentioned an old plant grow, which means structures. Let's get eyes on and go from there. I nod in agreement. We exit the car and move into the brush, continuing towards the source. The emissions are so overpowering I'm forced to stop and collect my bearings more than once. God, it's like someone opened a doorway to hell. There's so much pain here. I think of the mutilated bodies that have been turning up in shadow. We come to a break in the tree line overlooking a clearing that houses two buildings, one significantly larger than the other. Huh. No sign of Larry. You got a read on anything, Morg? I shake my head. No. Too much negative energy this far out. Maurice grunts, understanding. You up to search? I nod. Yeah. Should be able to manage a basic mental cloak. Besides, if you found Lacey, she'd probably freak out at your ugly mug. He smiles. Fair. I'd check the smaller one first. Looks like it's got a padlock. Might be where they keep the captives. I close my eyes, and concentrating at the space in the center of my forehead, take several long breaths. Is it working? I can barely see you. Just a ripple in the air. Good. Watch my back. Always. 
I move from the foliage and start cautiously towards the structures. The sons may not be able to see me, but who knows if they have alarms or booby traps rigged. To my surprise, I reach the smaller building without any sign of enemies. Maurice was right about it having a padlock. I've got a set of picks I'm decently handy with, but those will take time. Better to determine if Lacey's inside before circumventing the lock. But even this close, I still can't get a read on the damn thing. I move to the side of the building and spy a small, dirt-encrusted window. Taking the corner of my coat sleeve, I wipe away some of the grime to peer inside, and immediately wish I hadn't. The light of the full moon shines just enough to reveal the interior of the shed. Dozens of human skins, dried and hanging like leather. Damn it. Stifling the urge to vomit, I turn away, and hands only shaking slightly, move to the larger building that must have once been the grow house. Reaching it, I try the front door and find it unlocked. I pause to draw my pistol, taking a steadying breath, and softly push my way inside. The interior darkness swallows me alive, waves of malignant energy clutching and cloying. I take a moment to let my eyes adjust, and my breath catches in my throat. The inside of the grow house is one large room. Bikers lay sprawled asleep seemingly everywhere, on tables and chairs, and even passed out in the middle of the floor. The mixed stench of blood and sweat and booze, combined with the hostile mental energy, assaults me, and it's all I can do not to choke. Which one's the wolf man? Shouldn't he have turned by now? Can't tell. Everyone here looks human, more or less. Count my blessings. Cautiously, ever so quietly, I pick my way through the drunken mass to the back of the grow house. There, separated from the main area, I find another small room containing a large locked cage five feet in all dimensions. The lone occupant silently weaving in the corner is a match for the image I pulled earlier from Larry's mind. Lacey. I set down my pistol and ease the picks from my pocket, selecting one in a talk bar. So far luck is with me, the lock is easy to trip and no one seems the wiser. I replace the tools and pick my gun back up, easing the door open. I grip my teeth at the slight squeak of metal, but the only response from any of the sons in the other room is a loud snore. Lacey sits up confused, and I can see she's been stripped naked. <laughs> Who's there? Her voice drops to a terrified whisper. P please don't hurt me anymore. I consider for a moment. Look, don't freak out. I drop my mental veil. To her credit, she manages only a stifled gasp as I shuck out of my duster. Lacey, my name is Morgan. My partner and I are here to help. I'm close enough to sense her emotions now, a sliver of hope cutting through the stink of fear. Here. I pass her the coat and she wraps it around herself. Oh, thank God. They're monsters. They change. Shh. I know. Quiet. We aren't anywhere close to being out of here. Keeping one hand on Lacey and the other on my gun, I guide her into the room of sleeping sons that seems to have somehow grown three sizes in length. This is going to be a miracle if we get out. No sooner has the thought passed than a biker rolls over in his sleep, tripping Lacey. With a shriek of surprise, she falls into a table, knocking several glass breakers to the ground, shattering. Pandemonium breaks loose. I grab Lacey by the arm and sprint towards the door. The bikers rouse from their drunken stupor more quickly than I'd have hoped, hooting and hollering as they chase after us. A gorilla of a man steps into my path and I shoot him in the head, brain and bone exploding out the back of his skull. I, aim my, I shift my aim and fire off two more shots, dropping a pair of suns. The group's mocking turns angry, and several pull rings from pockets and slip them onto fingers, their forms shifting. In moments, the men are replaced by snarling wolves the size of malamutes. They flow in a pack formation around Lacey and I, yipping and barking as I waste the rest of my ammo trying to hit them. I drop the gun and draw my knives, crouching in a defensive posture, doing my best to keep Lacey behind me. The wolves circle in, snapping and snarling. One of the still human bikers steps forward. Man, babe, you killed some of my crew. And you're gonna have to pay for that. He grins. Maybe like doggy style. The others laugh and howl in approval. Hey. The spoken word is quiet and calm, but nevertheless reaches the whole room. All of us, human and wolf alike, look to the door. Whatever we expect to find there, it isn't Larry. His slight naked frame standing in the entrance. That's my wife, you fucksticks. Beside me, I feel fear explode from Lacey at the sight of her ex-husband. The light of the full moon shining on him, the pieces suddenly fall into place. Oh, fuck. Where the werewolves change seamlessly, Larry's transformation is the stuff of nightmares. He screams as bones crack and rearrange. 
his face elongating into a fang-filled cavern of razor-sharp teeth. We watch as one, mouths agape as the change completes. The beast stands to his full height, towering above us, yellow eyes emitting nothing but hunger and rage. And then, the killing starts. The wolfman flies into the bikers as they try to escape, his claws opening flesh with every thrust of his massive paws. One of the werewolves leaps at the monster's throat, but Larry turns and catches the attacker's head in his enormous jaws, its skull popping like a grape. It's over in an instant. It takes me a moment to realise that, besides the bikers already dead and those quickly bleeding out, somehow Lacey and I are the only ones left with the creature. With a snarl, Larry leaps at us. Too stunned to move herself, I tackle Lacey to the ground in a panic, a glancing blow from the wolf sending us spinning across the floor. Desperately, I throw myself on top of her and try to pull a mental veil over us, unsuccessfully. I scream in defiance, brandishing the knife I've managed to keep hold of as Larry regains his balance and charges with a roar. The gun blast behind me is deafening, the silver slug punching through the wolfman's chest and dropping him to the ground with a whimper. The beast tries to regain his feet, but Maurice calmly steps past me, points the barrel at the monster's head, and puts a second round through his eye. I gingerly push myself to my feet, examining the carnage around me. Nice shot, I pause. Thanks. Maurice nods in acknowledgement as he reloads. I spy my dropped revolver and retrieve it, taking my partner's cue and reloading. Maurice moves to Lacey where she lies unconscious. I hear him inhale sharply. Morgan. I look where he's pointing, see the deep furrows ripped into her shoulder by Larry's claws. Sorrow, quickly followed by an icy rage, fills my chest. Damn it. I can only consider a moment before taking my revolver and putting it in her limp hand. Morgan, what are you doing? I shrug, giving her an option. I indicate the massacre around us. You didn't feel it. She was terrified, Maurice. It's like you said, you don't fuck around with a wolf, man. I stand and move to the door. Come on, let's get out of here before Lou finds the balls to call the cops. And oh, I look at my partner over my shoulder. I told you so, asshole. Fighting bitter tears, I walk out into the night, the light of the full moon guiding my way. I was camping with my friend David last summer up in Idaho. We're pretty big campers and we love to go hiking. We were in Idaho once before back in 2018. We were thinking about relocating in that state as California is just extremely expensive to live and extremely overpopulated. We're just sick of it and we like our plastic straws. Anyways, we had set up an Airbnb for two weeks. And out of that time, we were down to our last few days before we had to return home to California. We planned to spend at least two days out there before going back to pack everything up and get ready for our flight back home. Everything was great. We set up our tents, we had the barbecue going, we were tossing some brews back and listening to some tunes on one of those wireless speakers that hooks up to your phone with some Bluetooth thing. It was really great. We were really just jamming out and telling jokes. It was really fun. That was, until the howls came. It sounded so close, yet so far away. I know that probably doesn't make any sense, but we couldn't figure out what direction it was coming from. Was it wolves? Was it coyotes? Was it just some wild dogs? I didn't think it was any of those things. It sounded off. It sounded wrong. We both stayed quiet, focusing on our surroundings. I looked at David, and I kind of gave him a puzzled look like, what the hell? He smiled and cracked another beer. Well, screw it, we are out in the woods. As long as they ain't messing with me, it's all good. It kind of gave me a sense of relief just kind of hearing that. I was a little tense, to be honest, but after hearing that and cracking open a beer myself, I kind of started to relax a little bit more. About four beers later, a couple shots of Patron and some burgers on the grill. We were both feeling pretty good. We almost ran out of cigarettes. Luckily, I bought another pack and I threw it over to him. Oh, thank goodness. There was no way in hell I was going to drive to the market to get some more. 
Yep, I always plan ahead, I replied. Oh yeah? Then how did you plan this one out? David lifted his leg up and let out the juiciest, most raunchy fart I have ever heard in my life. I almost dropped my beer in disgust. Good God! That's disgusting! You need to go check your man panties. I think that one was wet, I said laughing. The night was still young, and drunkily we decided to go on a little hike before we decided to call it a night. Which was a blessing in disguise, yet we didn't know it at the time. So we grabbed our wallets, keys, cigarettes, and a couple beers to go, and we went off. Unfortunately, my dumbass forgot my flashlight, but luckily David had his with him. Fast forward about an hour. It was a great little hike. Luckily, the path that we were on wasn't very steep. It was mostly flat ground. As we were on our way back, that's when we heard some shuffling, screaming, moaning noises coming from up ahead in the direction from where our campsite was located at. It sounded wrong. <laughs> We stopped in our tracks, and I got goosebumps all over my body. Even to this day, telling this story, it still scares the bejeebies out of me. We started creeping very slowly towards our camping location. We hit around some brush as I saw the silhouette. David saw it too. It was this large, black figure. I swear, it even looked like it was full of fur. Its eyes glowed a dark red color, and its teeth were razor sharp like some canines. It was scavenging through our tent, ripping up all kinds of stuff that was inside that we had planned out for the weekend. The ice chest was utterly destroyed. All of our meat, all of our food was everywhere. I don't know if I was more scared or confused. What the hell was this thing? It reminded me of a giant wolf, but it had the stature of a man. It looked muscular, yet it also had the figure of someone that's starving. It was very frail, yet in shape, if that makes any sense. It was lean. Yes, it was lean. I whispered to DJ, What, what the hell is this? He just shushed me with his finger. Be quiet. You don't want him to know we're here. Like hell I don't. That's our stuff. I think we both sat there for about five to ten minutes just watching in amazement, yet terrified all at the same time. Whatever this beast was, didn't know we were there. Until it stopped what it was doing, lifted its nose in the air and started sniffing. Oh shit. I think it knows, DJ said. Well fuck it, let's scream and scare this thing off. We both jumped out of our area, stomping our feet hard on the ground while our hands are waveling everywhere, screaming as loud as we could at it. The creature got seriously spooked and darted back into the woods. I swear, it was like a blink of an eye. That beast was incredibly fast. I thank God that we went on that hike. Because if we had went to bed that night, we may have been its meal. I live in northern Michigan. Technically, the part that's connected to Wisconsin. I know, it's weird. It doesn't seem right, but that's the area that I live in and that this story is about. Anyways, I'm not going to give the exact city or town that I'm in, but just know it's in that range of facility. I was camping with my friend Chuck, and we were having a great time. It was summer break from high school, and we wanted to just do something, just the two of us, because there's really not a lot of kids in our neighborhood, and, you know, it's 16 years old, had a driver's license, we wanted to kind of just get out there and explore. Luckily, the area that we wanted to go camping at was only about a 30-minute drive from our town, and our parents agreed to let us go as long as we checked in with them once we arrived. We had a very large 10x10 tent 
That way, it was plenty of room for both of us, including our things and our tennis shoes, as we were both deadly scared of spiders. We set up our lawn chairs. We had our ice chest full of sodas and waters. And between you and I, Chuck stole a few beers out of his stepdad's cooler in the back, so we had a few brews to have as well. We had everything laid out on the picnic table. I was going to cook a great feast for dinner. Well, the only thing I knew how to cook. Hot dogs and hamburgers, that is. It was a fabulous meal. We stuffed ourselves beyond belief. I mean, we seriously got some food coma, plus the beers that we were not supposed to have. That didn't help either keeping us awake. After we finished all of our food, and finished up those brews, we told some ghost stories around the fire pit, and eventually just decided to pass out. I don't recall what time it was, but I woke up with a bladder full. I had to pee bad, like real bad. Like you're in the middle of a Star Wars movie in the theaters and you don't want to leave because you don't want to miss what's happening bad. It's like a bowling ball inside your bladder, it's horrible. I didn't want to go outside the tent because I knew it would be freezing cold and pitch black. Half asleep, I grabbed my flashlight and put on my jacket and crept my way over to the zipper of the door of the tent. I slowly unzipped it, not trying to wake up my bud. I put on my shoes and stepped outside. Jeez, it was ice cold outside. And it was summer. But out here, it's like that. I was far too sleepy and lazy to actually walk to the pit. Well, that's what I call it at least. It's actually just an underground porter potty with walls. I just decided to go into the brush and find a decent tree to relieve myself. About a minute or two later, I found the right tree to leave my territory at. That way nobody else would see me at a neighboring site. Not that anybody would be awake at this late of an hour at night. That... And it was freezing cold. There really wasn't much to see anyways. When I was wrapping things up, I started hearing these crackling noises like something was moving around near me. My first thought was, maybe it was just my friend. Maybe he had the pee too. I looked around, but I saw no one. Then I thought maybe it was a rodent or a raccoon or something. So I just brushed it off and finished my duty. All of a sudden, everything just went quiet. I mean, everything. Not even the insects were making noises. It was like somebody muted the forest around me. That put shivers down my spine. I just sat there with wang in hand, just anticipating, but not knowing what I'm anticipating. Scared stiff. My heart was beating hard in my chest. It felt like I was having a panic attack. But what for? I stood there confused. Then I slowly started walking back to our tent. As I was arriving back to our section, I was checking out the tent as I was approaching it, when I saw something behind the tent to the right of it in the background in the brush. It was red eyes. I couldn't really see the silhouette too well. All I saw were these dark red eyes in the distance beyond the tent. At least, I thought they were eyes. The positioning was perfect. But it confirmed my theory when I heard it growl. I then knew that something was watching me. I turned my flashlight on and beamed at the beast. I was utterly scared shitless. What I saw still haunts my dreams, even though I only saw it for a split second. When I shined my LED flashlight at it, it spooked it and it darted off into the woods. But before it did, I got a look at that thing. I swear. It was like looking at a giant coyote or something. But it stood like me. But it was bigger than me. Much bigger. But lean. 
the thing was covered in fur like some type of Bigfoot thing, but it looked like a dog. God, it was ugly. Jesus. It still haunts me. I ran to the tent and woke my friend, blabbering, trying to explain what the hell happened. Of course, he wasn't believing a word of it. That and he was still half asleep when I was trying to explain the situation. It took a good 15 minutes of convincing, but I finally got him to grab his things that he could carry and we got the hell out of there as quickly as possible in the middle of the night. I didn't care. I wanted out of there, regardless of what he believed or not. He still doesn't believe me to this day, but yet, we've never been camping there since. I live in Carlsbad, California. It's a pretty rural area to say the least. It's considered a city, but there's a lot of open fields and lands out here. Carlsbad is known for coyotes and rattlesnakes, so it's pretty wild at times. You kind of have to watch where you're stepping when you're out there hiking. Anyways, this is a true story that happened to me when I was a child. It still bothers me, because it's unexplained. My family had two chihuahuas, a tan one and a black one. Well, the tan one obviously had to go to the bathroom. This was in the middle of the night. He kept barking and scratching at the front door of our house. I knew my mom was going to make me do it anyways. So half asleep, I got up and walked over towards the front door. Normally, I would have grabbed for the dog's leash, but my dogs are pretty good about handling their business and just running back inside. I cracked open the front door, and Peanut ran outside. I opened the door a little bit more so I could squeeze out and just kind of leaned my shoulder against the edge of the door watching him. Man, was it cold out. I mean, there was just a slight breeze, but it was deadly cold. I forgot to grab a sweater, so I just crossed my arms as my whole upper half was full of goosebumps and my nipples were rock hard. Man, it had to be at least in the 30s tonight, I thought to myself. I glanced around. Where was Peanut? Looking ahead to the right a little, Ah, there you are, boy. You almost done? It's cold out here. Hurry up. I swear, as soon as the dog turns its head to give me some type of acknowledgement, this large black thing leaped out from the brush, snagged my dog, and ran on two legs back into the woods. It all happened so fast. This creature was pure blackness. Its ears were pointy like a canine, but it galloped and hopped on its back hind legs like, like a man. I took a few steps off of my porch, but stopped. What am I going to do? Run into the woods and look for this beast? I ran back inside, screaming, trying to get my parents to wake up to explain what I saw. To this day, they still just think it was a coyote. We never did find Peanut. I know nobody's going to believe me. Nobody ever does. Nobody ever has. But what I saw, I can't unsee in my memory. To this day, there's no blurriness. It's just as clear as it happened. I was out hiking with a couple of buddies of mine. I know, this is probably cliche from a lot of things that you hear online, but this is true. We're from northern Utah. I'm not going to give like details on the exact city we lived in, but what happened, happened. I've told my family about it. Some of them believe me, but most of them don't. It's pretty funny because the older generation of people in my family believe me, yet the ones that are my age, they don't. Okay, back on topic. We were on our hike. It was just the three of us. I'll call them Larry and Mo, 
for privacy reasons. It was only a four mile hike, two miles up and two miles down. There's a lot of different trails, but this one was more the longer ones and the more dense into the woods. So we all packed lunches, preparing to finally accomplish this trail. Saying in my superhero voice as we all entered the trail. Mo gave me a high five. He loves it when I do that. Larry just rolled his eyes and chuckled. We had a good steady pace. We weren't in any rush. We wanted this hike to last the whole day if possible. We reached this really nice area that we thought would have been a perfect place to have lunch. I'll skip through all the details, but we enjoyed our sandwiches and waters and sodas and we had a great time for our little lunch break. That was... until we heard it. We were all sitting pretty close to each other finishing up our snacks and stuff when we heard something echoing out around us. Calling Larry's name. Larry... Over here. Come over here. I stood up in a panic and looked at Larry. What? What is that? Mo stood up and grabbed Larry's arm. We need to leave. Larry was just dumbfounded. He was a loss for words. I don't blame him. We all three grabbed our things put everything back in the backpack so we started walking the trail back towards the direction of the parking lot. I know it's probably going to take us about an hour or so to get back, but whatever this thing is, it only sounded like one person, so there's three of us, so we weren't terribly scared, more creeped out more than anything. The sun was starting to set, yet it was still light out which was a benefit for us, so we thought. We all walked like we were in formation. I was in front, then it was Mo, and Larry was in behind. He was a little larger than the rest of us, if you catch my drift. We started hearing something moving in the brush. We couldn't pinpoint what direction it was actually coming from, as it sounded like it was coming from all directions. I was utterly freaked out at this point. What the hell was out there, and how did it know Larry's name? I think I was more concerned than Larry was. He was too busy texting or something behind us. He wasn't really paying attention. I was really freaked out. I think Mo was too. He had a very serious look on his face as we walked. Yes. You know you want this juicy booty. What? We both looked back. Oh, sorry, guys. I was just texting my girlfriend, Larry said. I can't believe you could even joke at a time like this. You got some freak of nature that knows your name out here, and you're texting when we're trying to get the hell back to our truck, I said. Mo kept quiet. He just nodded his head and just pointed forward to continue. And suddenly, the wind started to pick up. Yet everything went silent around us in the woods. Dead silent. Hurry, Larry. I'm right behind you. <laughs> as soon as we all heard that, we all started running at full speed towards the direction of the truck. I swear... I never ran so fast in my life. I periodically would look behind me and see the other two. They were slowly falling behind, especially Larry. Pick up the pace, guys. Don't stop. I would scream and continued further. A couple minutes later is when I heard it. We heard it. The screams. The screams of Larry. Mo and I both turned around quickly as we continued running to see Larry was gone. But for a split second in the brush in the distance, I swear I saw what looked like deer antlers, but much too high. We both stopped at our tracks. Oh shit, 
Do we go after him? I know we're close, Mo said to me. I don't believe we should split up. I think we should at least look really quick. Call the police with your cell phone, I replied. As he called the police, he was giving them the best description of our location as possible, just judging by how far we were from the parking lot and what trail that we took. We slowly walked back towards the direction of the screams. Back deeper into the wooded trail. My heart was beating out of my chest in fright. What has hurt my friend? And my friend is a pretty big guy. Whatever took him must have been huge. We heard our friend Larry scream again. This time, it sounded like it was farther away. We started walking at a faster pace. We took a right-hand turn around the bend, and that's when I saw it. Larry's cell phone. It was broken on the dirt ground, covered in blood. Then, we heard some loud screeching noise. It was so loud I had to cover my ears with my hands. That was enough for me. I screamed out the Mo that, let's go, let's get the hell out of here and get the cops. They can handle this. We turned around and jetted all the way back to the parking lot. It was another five minute run, but still, we were scared out of our minds. The police finally arrived about 20 minutes later. We gave them an exact description of what had happened and what I thought I saw. Of course, they just wrote everything down and proceeded inside the woods. They never did find Larry. My name is Matt. I hate school. Hate. I don't mind going there and hanging out with my friends during recess, doing some work in classes, even writing some papers. That's fine. I am scared to go to school. No, it's not the first day. I'm scared of what I saw. It's our substitute teacher for our science class. It was the end of class and everybody was turning in their work and walking out as the substitute was sitting at the desk where our teacher normally sits but is on maternity leave. We'll call him Mr. Yammy. I was the last kid turning in the assignment as I was trying to finish everything up. I'm not the brightest, but I get everything done. I turned in my paper to the substitute. Every day we usually get a different person as our regular teacher is going to be coming back in a couple of weeks. As I was walking towards the class door, I turned back to wave goodbye when... I swear, I saw Mr. Amy's eyes glowing yellow. It was a split second, I swear I saw it. But then when I blinked, it was normal, and he just smiled at me and waved. I brushed it off and shut the door. I swore I saw it. I saw his eyes, they were yellow. Like some type of reptile. The next time that Mr. Yammy came, I saw him in the parking lot. I tried to avoid him, but it was just no use. He had one of those old 5.0 Mustang convertibles. It was white with the white rag top. Good morning, Matt, he said. Uh, good morning, Mr. Yammy, I stuttered to say in response. If you wouldn't mind, Matt, would you meet me in the science classroom this morning before the bell rings? I'd like to discuss something about last week when I was here with you. Just us two. Ah, uh, okay, I replied. Now, I was really freaked the hell out. Was this guy gonna tell me that he's some frickin' mutant? Or maybe he wants me. Either way... I was almost ready to shit my pants. Why would this creepy-ass substitute want to meet with me privately before school starts? 
it just doesn't make sense. I followed him to the classroom. He just smiled, carrying his briefcase in one hand and his Starbucks coffee in the other. He grabbed the doorknob with his last two fingers with his coffee hand, and the door was open. He pushed it open with his shoulder and asked me to step inside. How was the door unlocked? I did as he said. He flipped on the lights and closed the door behind me, locking it. He stood in front of the classroom door, leaning his back and shoulders against the exit, the only exit, and he spoke. Now, Matt, who have you told? Told what? I said shakingly. You know, you know what I speak of. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I saw the way you looked at me. You saw something. I stood there dumbfounded. I didn't know what to say. Do I tell him the truth and said that I saw his lizard-like eyeballs? Or do I just play dumb? Would he believe me? I stood my ground, gulping any courage left I had within me, and said, I have no idea what you're talking about, Mr. Yammy. He stepped away from the door and put both of his hands into his khaki pockets. Hmm, are you sure? You gave me the most puzzling look last week. Yeah. Maybe I was in a deep thought. I don't, I don't remember last week much. I replied. I swear, it felt like an eternity before he finally nudged his head and just said, Hmm. Okay. I was just worried about you. I thought maybe you were in some kind of trouble. Oh. No, everything's fine. But thanks for asking. As soon as that happened, the school bell rang, and I could hear all the children heading our direction. Saved by the bell. Do you guys like camping? I used to love camping. We would do it at least three times a year, but not anymore. I absolutely refuse to go. We all do. We still go camping, but we do it in my mother-in-law's backyard, where there's other people around, and three six-and-a-half-foot concrete walls to protect us. You see... The last time we went camping, I mean, real camping, it was six months ago. I had reserved this beautiful spot right next to the actual flushing toilet bathrooms. It was the perfect location to set up camp. I reserved it three months online in advance. It was supposed to be a Friday night and Saturday night adventure. Just two nights and we would take off back home on Sunday. Well... We didn't even make it to Sunday. I don't want to give the exact location where we were, but it was near Lake Cuyamaca in San Diego, East County, near Mount Laguna, on Highway 79. I'll tell you that much. I mean, this place was legit. They have park rangers and everything. It was awesome. The only thing that sucks is that you had to buy... Their firewood because of some stupid beetle, but whatever. We did it anyways. We decided to barbecue early before it got too dark out, as it might be a little difficult as we didn't bring enough light. We had some s'mores, sang some songs, but mostly we wanted to get into some scary stories. I bought extra wood because I had a feeling it was going to be a long night. There truly is nothing better than having your favorite people around the fire with you telling ghost stories, getting hammered off some beer, and having some great food. If you don't believe me, then you ain't living, and you should try it. Just don't go there. I beg you. 
It must have been about 12.30 in the morning when we started hearing some weird sounds surrounding us. At first, we thought it was just some rodents or something, so we just had some giggles about it and, you know, from being paranoid and just carried on with our stories. But then we started noticing that these sounds started to sound like footsteps. The scariest part about it was it sounded like it was coming from every direction. We didn't know which way to turn to look and examine in the brush. That's when we all heard the howls. The howls of something. It wasn't a coyote, and that's basically all we have out here. We don't have big major wolves or anything, just coyotes. But what we heard was no coyote. I know. I hear them all the time where we live. For some reason, I got some serious chills. You know when you have that inner feeling just deep down inside your gut that something's wrong? Well, I definitely had it that night. It took some convincing, but we left that night. Just to be safe, always trust your gut. Even if you lose money over it, it's not worth your safety. I have recently stumbled onto some of your YouTube videos about the Dogman. It reminds me a lot of something that happened to me many years ago on a trip with the Boy Scouts. I would like to stay anonymous and have changed the names of people that had happened to be in it. It's a bit of a long story, but it starts in Wexford County, Michigan. I was in a small scout group in the early 2000s and I was around 12 years old. There was eight of us in total. Mike, Miguel, Scott, Duncan, Jason, Peter, Luke and I with two scout members. And man, did we love to camp. It was fun times staying away from our parents. We ate junk food and we hung out with all our friends. We'd sneak our Game Boys along with the link cables and traded Pokemon, but the most fun we had happened after dark. After the Scout Masters went to sleep, we'd all sneak out of our tents and into the woods in a small clearing near the camp that no one really went to. That was usually around midnight, if not a little before. Really, we played it by ear. The Scoutmasters snored heavily, so once we heard them snoring, we were out and ready to play our favorite game, Manhunt. We would decide who was it by rock, paper, scissors usually, and this time around, I was it. Three, two, one. Ready or not, here I come! I shouted as I lifted my head off of the tree we marked as home base. We always played with a rule that you couldn't touch base for ten minutes. That was it. It was fair for the person searching. Luckily, I was good at manhunt. So after ten minutes, I usually found mostly everyone. Well, usually everyone except Miguel. See, Miguel was one of those persons who was always willing to go the extra step. Climb a tree, hide deep in a bush, or even venture off to the edges of our bounds, which was about 30 feet away from the base tree. Ten minutes had passed, and I did in fact find everyone except Miguel. Then 20 minutes passed, and everyone got worried. Miguel was always ready to pounce on base after the 10 minute mark and celebrate. We all started searching the bounds. We were ready for the game to be over and to go back to sleep. Miguel! We were shouting quietly. Not to wake up the scout masters, of course, which in retrospect should have been the first thing we did. After another 10 minutes of searching, we all banded together to go searching for him. We decided to split up into groups and travel opposite ways to cover more ground, like in Scooby-Doo. 
we grabbed some flashlights from camp and paired up. I got paired up with Duncan and Luke, which was fine with me. Duncan and I were always close, often daring each other to do some stupid shit and get in the trouble. And Luke, well, Luke was kind of nerdy, but he was a good guy. He was the type of kid that would split his uncrustable with you if you wanted some. So, we went south while the other guys went north. We all agreed to meet at Base Tree and 20, and then we would go to the east and west. Not even five minutes into our rescue mission, I remember shit getting weird. We were walking and talking, trying to cut off the tension of our friend being missing by joking around by that local legend about the dog man got him. I mean, we thought it was ridiculous. Until we started seeing tracks. They kind of looked human, with five toes, but long. Like what you would expect a clown foot to look like without his shoes on. Luke was the first one to track. He was shaking. But me and Duncan told him it was probably just Miguel playing a prank on us. Miguel was a prankster, after all. We decided to follow the tracks, which seemed to be going the way we were. And it started to smell. Something like a dead animal. And we knew that wasn't Miguel. We didn't even need to say anything to each other to know to not go that way. We all turned around in what seemed like unison ready to bolt back to the tree. But Duncan grabbed our shirts. Stop guys. Did you guys hear that? He said in a serious voice. Quit fucking around dude. I said quivering ready to piss myself. You're going to scare Luke. I'm not kidding, Annan. I really heard something. It sounded like footsteps. Big ones. Rustling the leaves. At this point, I think Luke was checked out. He didn't make a sound. We stayed there in that same spot for what felt like an eternity, afraid to move. Just pointing our flashlights in the dark, trying to see if we saw anything. And eventually, we all talked ourselves out of being afraid. Luke recovered from his crippling fright and we decided to go back to the base tree, but not before we saw what that smell was. I mean, we were 12 year old boys. So, we pressed on into the denser foliage descending upon the smell. And before we knew it, we found it. A corpse. It looked to have been there for hours, with the blood pooling onto its back. Eyes bulging, skin pale, and honestly, that's not what scared us. What scared us was the fact that the belly of the corpse looked to have been eaten, with the ribs broken back and everything inside just gone. There was bloody handprints on the sides of the body that looked human, just big. What the fuck? I remember Duncan screaming. Luke fell to the ground in fright, crying, and I... I... I didn't know what to think. I mean, we all seen slasher and horror movies, but they don't prepare you for this. I won't even lie, I pissed myself. Luckily, it wasn't Miguel. It was a man with a big curly beard. Guys, we have to go now, Duncan said with composure. He seemed to be the least freaked out out of all of us, which was good. I mean, I wasn't in any shape to make any decision like leaving nor was Luke. So we picked Luke up and turned tail to run. As we started to leave though, we heard the brush around us start to rustle like someone was walking through it. We have to go guys, now, Duncan said. So we hauled ass as fast as 12 year olds could run, but it was no good. We were lost. We stopped running after what felt like a mile and we all knew we messed up. 
Do you think we're safe? I asked to Duncan. I, I don't know, said Duncan. But I think we're safer here than there. We decided to wait there, hoping that the other guys would come searching for us soon with the Scoutmasters. It's the first rule of being lost, so we sat there waiting around scanning the area around us with our flashlights. And that's the scariest feeling. Time passed us slowly, and soon enough, it was over an hour. An hour of idle conversation trying to keep us calm. Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, basically everything on the kids' WB Saturday programming. Just shit to get off our minds and keep us calm. But that honestly only goes so far when you're being stalked by something that rips a man apart like that. And then we heard it. A low growl. Almost like a Rottweiler. Hungry and ready to pounce on its prey. I knew we were fucked. But we weren't going down without a fight. Holy shit guys. Where the fuck is that coming from? I asked. I don't know man. It's close though. We all have a better chance of fighting it off as a group. So we all grouped together, pointing our flashlights out and holding our sticks at the ready. And as randomly as the growling began, it stopped. Was it playing with us? Having fun before its meal? We were center stage and ready for him to swoop in. And it did. Guys! yelled Luke. Dead center in his flashlight was the beast, staring us down. It towered over us, standing close to at least six feet tall, even though it's hunched over. It had brown hair, matted down with dirt and blood covered its body. It looked strong enough to take down even the fiercest predator, with sharp claws in its massive hands and feet. And its eyes, its golden yellow eyes, piercing us, gazing at its next meal and flashing jagged teeth. The beast charged at us. It wasn't afraid of sticks. It got close to us, close enough to Luke where it could smell its breath and it slashed Luke across his chest, knocking him to the ground. Duncan and I backed up, staring down at our friend bleeding on the ground at the helm of the beast. It looked up at us as to say, You can't escape. And we pretty much accepted our fate. It looked back down at Luke, drooling on him ready to feast. And to this day, I am so thankful for what happened next. What the hell is that thing? The scoutmasters arrived to save us. He drew his twenty-two pistol and shot at it, hitting him once in the eye and the beast ran off back into the forest hurt. <laughs> we left that night and Luke went to the hospital. He lost a lot of blood and had several broken ribs, but ultimately he lived. The other group ended up finding Miguel, who twisted his ankle and fell into a tree, losing consciousness. He had a minor concussion and was okay in about a week. The scoutmasters called the police about the body we said we saw in the beast, but by the time they got there, they were both gone. We were shown several pictures of people with the description we gave and found out that he was a homeless man who had been thrown from the park several times. They actually found his remains a few years ago a couple counties over. His bones were covered in claw and teeth marks and they said that he was eaten by wolves. But we know what we saw. We all had to attend therapy for years to deal with it. Our scout troop was disbanded, but others still use that park. Zack, please tell your listeners to learn from us. What goes bump in the night might be it for them.
This happened last summer. It was me and my buddy Josh. We were out camping for the weekend as we both had time off from school. I worked with people in therapy, and Josh made hot dogs. I know, go figure, right? Anyways, we both had agreed to take off that Friday as we didn't make a reservation, so we wanted to get there, you know, because half of the park is first come, first serve, and we definitely wanted to get a spot for that weekend. It was a good thing that we got there early that Friday morning, because we got this great spot that was right next to this entrance to this hiking trail that I definitely wanted to check out once we got everything set up. Once we unloaded my truck, the first thing we went to is to the ice chest to crack open a couple brews. We sat down at the picnic table and just relaxed for a good few minutes before we unloaded everything else. Once we downed our brewskis, we set up the tent and then started placing the lawn chairs around the fire pit. Hey, Josh, help me with this tent really quick. It'll go a lot faster if we do it together. Okay, cool, he responded. After we set up the tent about five minutes later, we put everything else in its appropriate place and decided to cook up a little lunch. I was cooking up a few burgers. They weren't the hugest ones, so I made two apiece for us, at least for that evening. And we had tons of different varieties of chips, from Doritos to Flamin' Hot Funyuns to Flamin' Hot Cheetos, which were basically our favorites. Josh cracked open another brew, and myself, I had to grab a Wild Cherry Pepsi, as I don't like to mix my food with my beer. I kind of like to have that separate. I know, it's kind of funky, but it's just me. So we're in the middle of chowing down on this serious golden grubbage, and Josh pulls out this seedy-looking case. What the hell is that, dude? I asked. Dude, this is my collection, let me show you. And he opens this leather briefcase thing up, and it's full of Pokemon cards. How old are you, 12? I started laughing, making fun of him. Shut up, dude. It's my thing. It's cool. Whatever you say, dude, I replied. Sitting parallel with Josh, I noticed him finishing up his chips on his plate as he was ravaging through the different pages of his Pokemon collection and I noticed that something was sticking out of his ass out of the corner of my eye. I glanced over at him, and I noticed it was some weird swirly-looking stick sticking out of his back pocket. Dude, what's that? You like some hard wood in your butt? I said to him in my butthead voice. <laughs> yeah, you like morning wood in your butt. <laughs> Dude, that's not just a stick. That's not just any stick. Josh replied. It's my wand. What? What are you talking about? Dude, have you never seen Harry Potter? Oh, God, are you serious, bro? Save some pussy for the rest of us. I started laughing. I can't believe you brought this stuff for camping, dude. We're supposed to be enjoying nature and getting away from all this stuff. Oh, my God. Hey, whatever, dude. Okay, you're in the goosebumps and are you afraid of the dark? And that's not necessarily adultish either, Josh replied. Well, he got me there, I will say. But at least I didn't bring it with me camping, I said in defense. He rolled his eyes and took a sip of his beer and said, Whatever, dude. To each their own. Touché, I replied. After we wrapped up our little lunch, we decided to go on the little hiking trail to see where it went to. We had no idea how deep it was, but that was kind of the whole point of the adventure. We grabbed our waters, and we headed off on the trail. I'm always up for a good adventure, especially when it comes to hiking. Josh, on the other hand, would have rather stayed behind and play with his little wand. I hope to God he didn't bring any of his robes either to go with it, I thought to myself. We were actually having a really good time hiking. We talked a lot about things from work, from school, and just basic life things that we were going through separately going to different schools. A couple hours had passed, and we were really deep in the woods at this point. Deeper than I expected the trail to even go. Usually these trails are about a couple miles deep, what I figured from the past going to different campsites. This one was different. This one just kept going deeper and deeper. A couple of times I wanted to just call it quits and head back, but we were just having so much fun just talking and telling jokes that I didn't want it to end, so we just kept going. 
It seemed like the further that we went, the more dense it became. It seemed like everything around us started to slowly enclose on us with the woods. The trail was becoming so narrow that we could no longer stand by each other as we hiked. And that's when we started hearing the noises. <laughs> We both stopped in our tracks and looked at each other, and then slowly looked around, gazing in all directions, trying to see what the hell that noise was. I never heard anything like that before in my life. What is that dude? Josh asked me, whispering. I... I don't know, I responded. But whatever it is, it sounds... close. I, I'm, I'm done hiking, dude. Let's just get back to our camping spot, Josh said. I nodded in agreement. Yeah, let's do that. We turned around and we started walking back in the direction from whence we came at a much faster walking pace. Unfortunately, the sounds didn't cease. As we continued our hiking back down the trail to our camping spot, we started hearing these howls in the distance. Is there coyotes or something out here? I said out loud. Josh didn't reply. He just looked at me. And then he said, That didn't sound like a coyote to me. Those words that he spoke put shivers down my spine. And we started the walk just a little bit faster. Unfortunately, we had walked quite a bit. So getting back to our camping site was no walk in the park. It was going to take a while. I swear, we were hearing something moving through the brush, through the trees, coming from all directions around us as we were walking back. We were never able to truly tell where it was coming from or what it was. Until we saw the eyes. By now the sun was setting and it was getting a little dark out. Paranoid at this point, we would periodically look behind us as we walked back to our camping spot. But that one time we turned around, we saw something behind the trees, staring at us. The silhouette was dark and very tall. It looked like it had pointy ears, but it was really hard to tell as it was already getting kind of dark out. But the eyes, the eyes glowed red, a dark red. Whatever it was, snarled. You could hear its bass echo through the trees. I knew we were close, but were we close enough to make a sprint run for it and actually make it back to camp? At least if we got back to camp, I had a gun with me. It was a 9mm, but it was something, right? I motioned to Josh. Should we do it? Should we just make a run back to camp? Josh kind of looked puzzled at me. I don't know if I can make it that far. I have no idea how close we are. Well, if we just keep walking, this thing may just snag us. But whatever this thing is, it's probably faster than us anyway, so what would it matter? He replied. I would say about 30 seconds after we were debating on what the hell to do, I looked ahead and I saw the familiar-looking wooden sign that was out in the distance in front of us. Look, that's the entrance to the trail. We're almost here. Let's make a run for it. He nodded and we sprinted as fast as we could back towards camp. We could hear the thumping of whatever that thing was in the distance, its heavy footsteps vibrating the floor beneath us. As soon as we reached camp, I ran to my backpack and pulled out my pistol and turned around and aimed. But there was nothing there. I stayed ready. And all of a sudden, this thing ran across the trail from the left to the right side, dashing into the woods in front of me. I shot twice at it. Did you hit it? Josh screamed. Uh, I, I don't think so, but maybe we scared it off. I don't care, dude, at this point. Let's just get the hell out of here. I don't even know what the hell that thing was. I couldn't have agreed more with Josh. We quickly grabbed our personal belongings and rushed over to my truck. 
leaving the ice chest, lawn chairs, and our tent and everything else behind as we got in the truck and sped off into the night, never to return. This happened to me about 10 years ago. I worked at a psychiatric ward in central Pennsylvania. I was on a 10 minute smoke break out back. I was just checking out my cell phone texting my girlfriend that I was going to be home a little bit late as someone was late to relieve me from my shift. I was about halfway through my cigarette just enjoying myself on the chair as I looked out into the wilderness. The hospital that I worked at at the time was surrounded by a dense forest. It was about 9.45. I was supposed to be off work at 10 o'clock, but the person that was supposed to relieve me was running late, so I figured I might as well take another break since I had nothing better to do to wait for him to arrive. The employee back porch area where I like to smoke my cigarettes on my breaks in peace, there's no lights back here, so my eyes quickly adjusted to the darkness. After I finished texting my girlfriend, I just stared out into the woods and enjoyed its beauty. I've always been one for nature, so I always admired my surroundings while on break. And just then, that's when I saw something coming out of the wood line. At first, I thought it was a big deer. I couldn't really tell at first. I leaned forward in my lawn chair and really tried to truly examine it more closely with my eyes. No, it wasn't a deer. It was some type of wolf. It was pretty big though. I didn't know that wolves would get that large. It was pitch black out and so was its fur from what I could tell. It was just trotting along as if it didn't care if it was being noticed. And then all of a sudden it just stopped right in its tracks. It tilted its head and I swear for a split second it looked right at me. I'm at least 60 yards away. It must have saw the cherry on my cigarette or something because, I swear to you, it looked directly at me. It seemed like hours that we had some kind of a trance staring contest, but realistically, it was probably only about 10 to 20 seconds. Then, it tilted its head up to the sky and let out a huge howl. It hopped up on its back hind legs like a man, stretched, turned around, and then ran into the wood line, disappearing without a trace. I blinked my eyes hard and stood up. Did I just freaking see what I just thought I saw? No, it couldn't be. No animal could just hop on its back legs like that. What the hell was that thing? I told my coworkers about this, but they didn't believe me. But I know what I saw. When I was in Boy Scouts when I was a child, we went out camping for a week-long expedition with our camp counselor and some other members. I remember it was this one particular night that we were in our tent telling some ghost stories, eating some chips and some trail mix. I honestly don't remember what time it was. I mean, we were all like 11 and 10 years old, so who knows? I mean, I don't remember having a watch at that particular time, but it was late. We started hearing some weird, odd noises outside of our tent. None of us actually had the guts to unzip the tent and take a look outside, so we just sat there amongst ourselves with our flashlights in silence. At first, it just sounded like something large was just brushing through the trees amongst our tent. But then, but then the house started coming. Our first thought was coyotes. I mean, they are common amongst this area. But there was just something weird, something odd about how they sounded. That told us that it was no coyote. What else could it have been, though? My friend suggested that it was the werewolf, and I just laughed. No, werewolves don't exist. But nobody else spoke. We just continued to sit there in silence and waited. 
I don't know how long we sat there, but we never heard anything else for the remainder of the night. We all eventually fell asleep, waiting. For what? I don't know. When we told our lead in the morning, he just laughed at us and just told us we were just telling too many ghost stories that night. But I know what we heard was real. Whether it was a werewolf or a coyote or whatever the hell it is, it was real. And it was close. It was a dark and quiet night that we were camping out in the woods. It was supposed to be just a couple nights over the weekend. A couple of peaceful nights. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. If you're finding this journal and you haven't found me, just assume that I'm dead. My name is Brandon, and I was out here with a couple of my college buddies. The first night, we were having a great time. After we set up camp, we were drinking and barbecuing on the grill, having some fun, playing some tunes around the fire pit. Everything was kosher. It was really just a normal night. That was until my friend Bob went missing. At first, we thought maybe he ended up going number two instead of just taking a number one out there alone in the woods. But after he disappeared for at least 20 minutes, we started to get concerned. We grabbed our flashlights and we started echoing his name throughout the area trying to figure out where he may have went. When we got no response, that's when we really started to worry. David and I split up around the camping area seeing if we could cover more traction that way. About another 15 minutes had passed and still no Bob. A few minutes later, I found Bob's shirt hanging on the edge of a tree branch nearby. When I approached it, I noticed it was covered in red blood. It must have been Bob's blood, because Bob wasn't carrying any type of weapons when he went to go to the bathroom. I started to panic at that point. I screamed out to my buddy David, and eventually he made his way over in my direction as I was waving my flashlight up in the air like a maniac trying to get his attention. David confirmed that it was indeed Bob's shirt. I suddenly had goosebumps all over my body. What had taken our friend, and why? Then, then we heard the screams. The screams from our friend Bob, somewhere in the distance. No! 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 At this point, all we had was a hatchet and some pepper spray. But that was enough for us. We had to find where those screams were coming from, and fast. The screams continued to no, echo. No, no, no. All we could do is just try to pick the right direction, even though it was really hard to even do that at the time. Then, we heard the howls, but they didn't sound like anything I've ever heard before. They were different, definitely more sinister. At this point, we were so extremely scared, but we had no choice but try to help our friend. We tried a different approach. Instead of screaming and using our flashlights to try to get whatever's attention was out there to try to find our buddy Bob, we kept quiet and slowly walking in the direction for where we were hearing the noises. Maybe, just maybe, our friend was still alright and we could help him by some type of surprise attack. Hopefully. After about 20 minutes of walking, we were totally and utterly lost. At this point, we were hearing his screams coming from different directions at the exact same time. I think whatever was out there was truly messing with us. Maybe it wasn't even our friend Bob making these noises. Maybe whatever it was outside was trying to lure us into some kind of trap. 
But of course my friend David said I just watched one too many movies, but hey, I don't hear any other bright ideas, and we still haven't found our friend. We took a five minute breather against some trees and sat down on a rock. I pulled out my journal, and this is basically where I've been entering things lately. I'm going to close this chapter right now for the journal, because we really have to find our friend. And my buddy David just told me to go over to where he was at. He says he saw something in the distance. It looked like eyes. Glowing eyes just staring at us from the moonlight. I'm going to go over there and check it out and see if he's full of crap. I'll add more later once we find Bob.